Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 176. So glad you could join me. Today's guest, Angela Voris Hills, will be here in about 10 minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. Uh, we just do this we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click on the like button and share and subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Leave reviews on iTunes or Spotify or whatever to help spread poetry around the internet. Uh, the admission price is $0. All we ask is that you help spread the word that this is such a great time. We have a great time every Monday night on the Rattlecast. And do remember, they have open lines later. So if you'd like to share a poem, get one ready. I'll post the information on how to do that at the next hour. Um, and then the second hour is always open lines. We have a special guest tonight, too. Clint Margrave is back. Um, he was on Rattlecast number 24. We've been doing this show for over three years now. And that means that... Um, you know, some people who are on before have new books, and Clint has a new book, Visitor. So he'll be sharing that and talking, uh, talking about it a little bit and sharing a couple poems in the second hour before open lines. So sit tight for that. Now, as always, we're going to start with our Poets Respond poet, though, and see what's going on in the news through poetry. And a familiar face was the poet this week. T.R. Powelson is here, um, and she had a poem about listening to your union workers. So, hey, T.R., how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you again. Always love formal poems, of course, so I always love to see your poems in my uh, submittable inbox. And um, and this is a really interesting form, but tell us first about how uh, the poem came to be. What was the article that inspired it? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the subject matter of the poem, the incident that the poem describes in the fog happened about a year ago. So that has sort of been dancing around in my head wanting, wanting to be written about, but I've never really found you know the right way to write about it and i also i wrote another poem titled 573992 about that truck that you have already rejected long ago <laughs> and which is still searching for home <laughs> so it's it's funny that the sequel surpassed the original and I, mean, I wouldn't even call it a revision it's a totally new poem but um yeah the sequel about the same lo different love poem to the same truck i guess is what i'd call it <laughs> Uh -huh. And so this one's been in my head. And then, you know, the whole fiasco with Southwest Airlines happened. And at the same time, the Southwest Airlines fiasco happened. One of the push pencil pushers at my work decided, oh, Menlo Park Center doesn't need any more small trucks. We'll just replace them all with big trucks. And I showed up to work on, I think it was a Thursday morning, and to utter chaos, where apparently my center manager had been up all night fighting to save our small trucks that deliver in the hills. And so that crisis was somewhat avoided, except they took all our extra ones. So if there's a breakdown, who knows what we're going to do. But um, so that then, in, then I stumbled upon the New York Times article where they taught where and it talked about how the union members had actually been warning the company a long time for a long time that chaos was lurking and it wouldn't take much to have a meltdown. And to the, to the extent that they even asked for, it was more important that to them to fix this infrastructure at Southwest Airlines than it was their own pay raise. And that's so often how I feel about my safety. I mean, if I'm not around, I mean, a paycheck doesn't mean much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, and it happens like that so often where just, you know, you think you know things and then if you're not on the ground, you don't really know what, what's going on or how things work, you know? So it's a great, great lesson for everybody, not just uh, employers, but, but everybody having opinions about things. Um, the other interesting thing, this poem is a monotetra, which is a form I've never heard of before. Um, what is that? And where do you, like, it's rare that there's a form I've never heard of, but, uh, this is definitely one that is new to me. How did you find that? And, and can you tell us about the form a little bit? Well, um, the form is new to me as well. And I often find that, you know, the hardest subject matters, I need the stricter forms, which is sort of counterintuitive. That, you know, my first draft of this was free verse and it sucked. Um, and I thought, well, I, okay, I'll go to a uh, terzarima, which is my bread and butter form that I just love. And that didn't work. So I thought, you know what, I need a really strong form that, that has a lot of requirements. And so I've been reading this book, Fat Girl Forms by Stephanie Rogers, oh. which I absolutely love. Yeah, there's a, um, poem a friend from, of mine recommended that book. it we to should me. Have her, we should have her on, actually, because, um, yeah, yeah, because there's a poem from Oh, yeah, you there. should have her yeah. on as a mm -hmm. guest. 
Um, and I just, I, I love it. I love what, how she integrates the stuff into the forms. And yeah, she introduced me to some forms I'd never heard of before. So the mono tetra is basically, it's quatrains that are mono rhymed. And then you have that, that, um, it's still tetrameter, but it's a repeat that you, that happens at the end of each stanza where you repeat the same phrase, mm -hmm. um, pretty close to exact, but I played with that a little bit. And then for my ending, my ending stanza, I left that out and I sort of did that intentionally because I wanted to suggest that, you know, the uncertainty of the future. And mm -hmm. so I, that was a deliberate breaking of the form that, yeah, well, the form. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting, I, I looked up some other examples, and um, they didn't use enjambment as much as you. I mean, everything was sort of like more refrain-like, and so weaving an enjambment through those uh, repeated refrains is a really interesting thing to do too. Uh, let's hear it now, though. Uh, listen to your union workers. Uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. I've got it here. Listen to your union workers. Tale of a UPS teamster. I too have flown southwest, scrambled for my window seat, bedraggled by long lines like herds of cattle. Loved to travel, loved to travel, to watch storm clouds unwind and blue beyond the winglet. Never knew the truth beneath those cow reviews, but now I do, but now I do the math. I work for stockholders who've never done my job, bolder men and women open folders, numbers smolder. Numbers smolder fat. And I am one. Storms snarl flights and labor. I too labor, fight to tell my story. Overnight last week I tried, last week I tried to make sense of numbers. My trucks, 573992, gold stuck on her fender. Mine on paychecks. She an object. She's an object I love. The ones who make money plotted to replace her with one that's bigger, clumsier. Their plan twisted in lines, twisted in lines on maps. They've never seen my roads that wind narrow among redwoods and slopes. Late one night as fog flowed in dark, I slowed. In dark, I slowed to let a car pass, its lights soft haloed. Blind in beauty, I stopped close to the edge. The damp blurred drop among limbs lost. Among limbs lost to list, my truck held me safe, sure. The truck slipped by so close its mirror whiskered my bumper, disappeared in mist, in fear. In mist, I fear what might happen in another truck less nimble, made for other terrain. My center manager chose to save her, chose to save her from the flatbed trailer assigned to take her. 992 is mine for now, the last of her design. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Tia. It reminds me of, I had the uh, the experience of driving back up to Wrightwood through um, through the mountains. I took the mountain way thinking the weather was fine from our reading series, actually, with my daughter in the car. And then the fog came in, and I could not see the road. And it was this mountain, gosh, mountain windy road like that. I had no idea they'd, they'd um, like, were repainting the fog lines. There were no fog lines. And it was just, I had to creep back, like, in reverse until I could turn around. And then it took, like, five hours to get home. It was one of the worst experiences of my life, pretending not to be scared. So um, definitely those mountain roads, they need, uh, they need nimble vehicles, and uh, they get a little dangerous out there. Yeah, and it's funny. The, I love the photo you chose because it sort of it fits in thematically. But... You know, as I, I mean, in one of my posts, I said, you know, that road is not nearly as narrow as Bear Gulch Road, which is <laughs> where this happened. Uh, that the, the curves are blinder. There's no there's no guardrail. There's no line. There's a section of the already narrow road they call the narrows where it gets even narrower. <laughs> and, uh -huh. you know, and one of my poor friends was joking about how, yeah, we've already we've read plenty of poems about Bear, Bear Gulch Road. But that's another first for me is the first published poem about. Road. <laughs> That's great. Well, it's going to haunt you for a long time, I think. But thanks so much for sharing that, Tia. Excellent poem, as always. Good to see you. Yeah, fun joining in. And I'll, I, I, yeah, have a great one and looking forward to listening to the Rattlecast. Excellent. Thanks. Take care. That was T.R. Paulson with uh, Sunday's poem, Listen to Your Union Workers. Now, we are going to take a quick break and go to uh, tonight's main guest, 
Um, Angela Voris Hills is here. So hold tight, uh, sit right where you are, grab a drink, and uh, we'll be right back in just a moment with Angela. back. Thanks for your patience. Like I said, today's guest is Angela Voris Hills, poet, community organizer, and instructor. Angela Voris Hills grew up in Wisconsin. She earned an MFA from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She's the author of the poetry collection Louder Birds with this beautiful cover right here, uh, selected by Tracy Brimhall for the Lena Mills Weaver Todd Prize. Voris Hills has received grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and Key West Literary Seminar, as well as a fellowship from the Writers' Room in Boston. She co-founded The Watershed, a place for writers, a literary arts organization which evolved into Arts Plus Literature Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. She now lives with her family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and here she is, Angela Voris Hills. Hey, Angela, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I'm curious about the, um, the watershed and things like that because we do a lot of uh, organizing here, so I'm wondering what that is. We'll talk about that later, but let's start out. Do you want to share a poem? Sure, yeah. Um, I will be reading a poem from my book. Um, it's called At the Periphery Where Life Hums on page three. A white box is not the house. The house is not white. The house cannot be separated from the white barn, which is also not white, because the wood is rotting and its silo is silver. The beige formica table on its chrome legs cannot be removed from the kitchen. There are always oatmeal cream pies in the cupboard. But the children can leave and have left, and she remains with her mind separating into blue and red. Now someone must be paid to remove the pins from her gray hair and tie her shoes. There is an illusion of life when the colors connect. The doll she carries in her arms is the memory of all her children. She hums to them. She still hums, though they have grown and gone, and she cries, and in the corner, Mary is mourning, and the Bible is always open to a page. She may know the words by heart. She may not understand them at all. Today, the pages are blank. The Bible cannot be removed from the house. The house is not white. The garden is not green. The apples hang heavy and will soon collapse, covering the ground. And that was um, At the Periphery Where Life Hums, one of the early poems from Louder Birds by Angela Voris Hills. And um, so one of the things, this, this book came out a while ago, and I've been meaning to ask you on the show for a long time because it's such it's such a beautiful cover and, and title. I love the the way the book looks. And so I've, I've just, I've had it sitting there. And, um, you know, I, I go back to guests from previous episodes as we have room. And it's been sitting there for a long time. So I'm curious, how did you come up with this title? What, what does the title poem Louder Birds mean? And, and, and how did the, the cover come about too? 
Yeah, sure. I actually, um, next I could read the poem that is like the title poem and then it'll, I think it'll make more sense, but the cover is actually an amazing story. Um, a long time ago, I went to the Lakefront Festival of the Arts in Milwaukee and was like spending a lot of time in one booth and told my husband, like, if I could be a visual artist instead of a poet, like, this is what I would like this is the visual idea of what I want my poems to be doing um and then kind of fast forward a bunch of years later I get the book and I'm looking for some cover art and I had an idea in mind but the artist wouldn't work with me and then I remembered this like this artist from the festival um and I had no idea though who she was anymore I couldn't remember the name so I started googling like um Wisconsin artists like dead animals I, I mean you, and which led me in a lot of wacky directions but eventually I found her um her name is Katie Musoff and she does these watercolor paintings that are stunning like I mean this is watercolor and oh, wow. um it, yes it's it's everything she does is remarkable um but yeah so I found her and then we became friends and she let me use this art on the cover of my book and she I, we still are friends. I visit her farm sometimes. Like she's just very lovely. And it was just the best art, like cover art experience you could imagine. So yeah, yes. That is amazing. Yeah. I can't, I did not think that I thought that was a photo of some kind of, um, um, you know, what would, what would you call it? Like a still life with dead. I don't know what, what we, what do you call it? A taxidermy, I guess maybe, but I can't believe that's a watercolor. Wow. But yeah. Yes. Um, why don't you read the poem that the poem, the title comes from? Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I wasn't planning on it. So let me just find it really quick. Cause it's not tabbed right now. Um, here it is. All right. Page 14. Um, all right. <clears throat> the title is Moose as sign, as Moose sign, which is German for must it be? It must be. It's after John Wilde, who's a Wisconsin artist. Moose as sign, as Moose sign after John Wilde. Because the moon is a wafer bleeding beneath my tongue and the desert is still sleeping, it must be. Tomorrow stands with its toes at the edge of a volcano, pouring a red mess of life from its stomach into the earth's pit. If the day is not picked apart, first by the bills of louder birds, I will tear into it like bread. This is how the rhythm of the earth's core will continue beating. Yes, it must be this light in my hair or the moon's muted halo through which the stars swim like minnows in a bait shop tub. It must be the weight of my face in my hands or the weight of the body hanging from the meat hook watching with hollow eyes, waiting for a slip of the blade to release it. Yeah. And that was, um, I, I don't know how to say it. Muse, how did you say it? Muse scene? Moose as sign. A sign. As okay. Moose as sign <laughs> from Louder Birds. And so now that we've heard that poem, so, so why, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, it's one of the things that we haven't talked about a whole lot, actually, is how we come up with a title of, um, of, a, of a book of poems. Like, like how do you know what, because there's, there's so many images in your poem. Your, your poems are all really image rich. You could sort of pick, like I could pick a page at random and, and have some really cool image to use. Like, um, you know, like the painted turtles, wrinkled legs and stuff like that. Like you could have, there's so many options for titles. Um, so, so how did you come up with Louder Birds as the one that sort of represents the whole collection? And, and how do you go about that process of doing that? Yeah, well, so for the longest time, it was actually called The Account of Worms. Or here begin here begins the account of words. Like it had a bunch of other titles, um, and those other titles were taken um, from like bestiary kind of thinking. Um, anyway, so it went through a lot of title changes. Um, eventually, I don't. I think that this particular line and image of like a bunch of a bunch of birds fighting over, over life, I guess. Right. Um, and like wanting some of that for myself, I guess there was something about the image that really just stuck with me and the phrase stuck with me. It was a little bit 
I think there are questions around it. Like, what does it mean exactly? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So like there was an image, but it wasn't a very strong image. So it, I think it kind of worked its way through each of the poems equally because like, I don't think every poem is about the painted turtles with their necks outstretched, Mm -hmm. but I do think each poem is about the necessity of like that desire to want to tear into life uh, like it mm-hmm. red. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. And and it is, there's something about the, I, I was just trying to think of like what makes it a great title and there's something it is like you, you keep on there about the mystery of it. Like it doesn't give too much and it makes us like, cu- it makes me curious about what's going on in the book too. So that's one of the reasons it works so well. Um, yeah. So, so for you, how did you come to be a poet? I'm always curious about that, like the origin stories of poets. So how did you, when did you first like start to think you might take poetry seriously? Is it, was there a sort of point, like an inflection point in your life? Yeah, I actually didn't know. Right. I mean, I'm always very jealous of the people who were like, I wanted to be a writer since I was a child. I think I maybe did want to be a writer since I was a child, but I didn't really realize it was a choice or like a thing that people still did. So um, I was an undergrad um, and I was in English like comp class and we read stories by like Laurie Moore and we read David Sedaris and we read all of these contemporary fiction writers Um And I was like, oh, people are doing this? What's going on? And so I actually started writing fiction because um, I thought it was fun. And again, like I just had no idea people were doing that. And I was like copying everything that I was reading. Um, And then I took a fiction workshop and realized um, (laughs) very quickly that my stories really had no plot. They really didn't ever go anywhere. Like I hated narrative arc. I was always just writing stories where I was stuck in people's heads and like ruminating. (laughs) And um, I was really more interested in the way people were thinking and like the emotional kind of climax of a story rather than like the physical happenings of a story. Uh, And then I read a poem by Louise Gluck called The Drowned Children where it's very like sad and beautiful and ugly and terrifying at the same time. And I thought like, oh yes, like this is actually what I meant to be doing. I meant to be doing like the fact that you can do all of those things at the same time is amazing. And that's, that's what I should be trying to do instead of writing these like 14 page stories that go nowhere, right. That nobody wants to read. because they're like, nothing is happening. Um, Nothing has to happen in a poem. And that's, that's perfect. That's, That's my jam. So, yeah. So then at some point, um, I just started taking poetry workshops instead and seemed to kind of fall into it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hear uh, hear another poem. Sure. Yeah. All right. I'll read um, just one more from the book um, because TR asked me to read potentially this one. So I'll read uh, Maps of Places Drawn to Scale on page 48. 10 minutes from a two week vacation, a van flips on an exit ramp. In a small highway, it's just a van heading toward a hotel. This is global positioning. A man is ejected and the van lands on top of him. In a small town, a priest knows the man's name, but death does not concern itself with formalities. It also does not take the man whole only his legs and anything else it can grab below. At a Chinese buffet, Death is stuffing her cheeks with crab rangoons while a family stands behind her with empty plates. Nobody stuck to the vinyl booth finds you will suffer inside their cookie, but it's implied in the parking lot. A child breaks free from her mother's arms and runs headfirst into traffic. In the city, there are always detours, but in a small town, there's one name for each baby born, and eventually it's on the lips of everyone in the street. Yeah, that was Maps of Places Drawn to Scale, again from Louder Birds. And with three poems into this book, we can already see how much um, image stands out in in the poems. Like, they're really image-rich poems. 
Um, and, and that one moves through a lot of different scenes, too, with, with, that are rich with images. Uh, what is your writing process like? That, how does that, a poem like that come to be? Is it sort of a, a daydream where your mind is moving through images as you write? Or, or what, what is your process like to come up with poems like these that move from the, the accident to the restaurant to the, you know, the city and everything? You know, different things are happening, all these different scenes. Sure. Um, I am a mom and I have been a mom for like more than half of my life now. I had my first son when I was 19. So um, I and then I have two others. So I have now a 23 year old and a five year old and a nine year old. Um, So I never have more than like 10 minutes of solid thinking time. Um, So I tend to collect images and write them down. And when I have more than 10 minutes or more than a few minutes, I sit down and like put them all together. Like how, how do all of these pieces fit together? Like what's the story they are trying to tell? So um, yeah, so they're really, I, I want to say almost like collages, mm-hmm. like the, I think in images, I see images and then, and then they kind of all are pieced together. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. That's a different process than I've I've heard anybody anybody mention. So, do you have the sense that like, like as you're generating images that are going to be collaged into a poem, do you have a sense that you're drawn to certain images for a reason, or do you think the meaning comes out in the process of collaging and putting them together? I think the the meaning definitely comes out in the process. So, yeah, I'll pick up on like just some something will stand out to me, I'll jot it down. Um, And then I mean, usually, you know, if I have a list of, let's just say, like 10 different image idea, or lines, just something I've heard, um, I'll kind of like pluck out the things that all seem to, to gel. And then from there, kind of figure out like, what is this all? What does it all mean? Right? Um, Yeah, so I, I wait for all of those things to kind of come together and speak speak to me instead of trying to like force something onto them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we talked a little bit, I think before the show, maybe about how the, the book it's two years old. The book came out about two years ago. Um, but, but there's such a long process of like submitting and writing and publishing that you wrote the poems a long time ago. Um, what was your experience like um, having this? This was your first book and it won um, this, this great award. Um, what was the experience like of, of winning that award and then and then waiting for the book to come out and then promoting the book? Like, how do you feel? I'm always curious because my, I have to say, when my first book came out, I, it was very like a depressing feeling for me, actually. It was, I guess it was like, I've heard that um, when people get their like graduate degrees and like, a, you know, their PhD in science or something and they finish all that, there's like this like, what do I do now? Like, you know, like, I don't know how to organize my life anymore without this goal that I've now achieved. And so there's like this, there's a phrase for it, but there's like a postdoctoral depression or something. And, and I kind of felt that I felt like, like, God, what am I doing? I don't care about promoting this book. And there's this book. And now I'm going to write a new book. Is that what I'm going to do? And uh, I don't know. Was it a great like, what was your experience like in your first book? Yeah, I mean, I was so excited. I had been submitting like different versions of this book for maybe seven years. So um, it had gone through like a lot of different revisions and sent out for a long time. So I was so excited to have gotten the phone call and like to have won an award and to have such a great press. And it was very exciting. Um, And I planned a huge book tour and like launch party and did a lot of like, it was a lot of work to put all that together to like get to know people. Um, And then that was um, 2020. So the book came out in in February, mid February. Um, And so like, I actually was very excited and then was very disappointed, but for a different reason. So like all of my hard work kind of fell apart. And then after that, like now it has been like it. It, it feels like hard to kind of get that momentum up and going, like that kind of excitement back, right? Especially because since then I've started, I mean, even while I was submitting this book for publication, I had started another book. And so I was really getting amped up about the new poetry collection. And um, so it was like getting harder even at that point to be like super excited to keep reading these poems because I had kind of moved on to something else by then. But yeah, so it was a it was a bit sad just timing wise. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the thing is the the way that it spreads out so far. 
um, you know, from, from writing the poems to actually putting a manuscript together and then the iterations of the manuscript and then accepting it somewhere and then waiting for that to be published. It seems like we have such a, like, I wonder how much like, you know, like Billy Collins has a new book out, right? Did he write those poems seven years ago? Probably not. But I think if you're, but if you're anybody else, it, it's just such a slow process that you don't get that joy in the poems that are, that, that, you know, cause they're, they're, they're old. It's a different person who wrote the poems and there's a weird feeling that that, that happens. Um, how did the book evolve over time? Because you mentioned it took seven years of submitting it and, and changing it and iterating it. Um, did a sort of a theme emerge and, and was it different? Like if you looked at the very first version of the manuscript, how different was it from the seven years later award-winning manuscript that you have now? Yeah, it, it was quite a bit different. It started as the project I'd been working on um, for my MFA thesis. Um, and that was essentially kind of a a mock bestiary. So I am really into med medieval things and read a lot of like the medieval bestiaries um, and was kind of trying to frame it around uh, different animals. And yeah, I don't know. So it, it actually was like that for quite a while until a good friend of mine read it and was like, this is not like, what are you doing in England here? Like, this is a, a book about the Midwest. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right, it is. And so then it was after that, that I, I feel like the manuscript really found its, found its order and its organization, organizational principles. I don't know, it, it fell into place once I figured out like, oh, yes, that is right. It is not it's not a book about medieval times. It's a book about being here in the Midwest right now. So, yeah, uh, yeah. that's really interesting. So, what what is it that uh, that draws you to the the medieval times? That, that that what do you think is interesting about that? And I'm obsessed with didactic literature. Like, just like tell me how to do things. I am also really excited about um, you know like the things that we think are just silly used to be science, right? Mm -hmm. So, like. People would study animals to look for like moral guidance. Um, like that's amazing. And I don't know, just it's fascinating to me that people would look at the stars and like truly believe like this is science, like because the stars are over here. That is why I feel this way. Um, and like that was all they had to go on. Right. Like that was, that was as much as they had. Mm -hmm. you know, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, it definitely is. It always makes me wonder, like, what do we think? Like, what do we take for granted that, that might be, seem as foolish as, um, as what, you know, what, what we think of as, as what they took for granted back 500 years ago or whatever? How, what is medieval times? That's a thousand years ago, 800 years ago? What, what, what period is that? 1400s. Okay. Yeah. Wait, yeah. 1380, 13, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. 14. Right. I don't know. That's just one of the things. The Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. I don't know. History is too many facts for me. That's, that's how I feel. Too much to number. memorize. It really is. Too many dates. Um, so let's hear another poem. Do you want to do another from the book or do you want to move to the next? Uh... Yeah, I'll move on to something something newer. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this is from the, an, another collection that you're working on right now, right? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Two months before my son leaves for Belgium, we visit the zoo. And a few months before that, the airport is bombed. I get message, message, message. Am I letting him go? And maybe I'm to blame because I never told them I'd once caught him running on the roof of our third floor, that he was once hit so hard by a car, his shoes flew from his feet into air. A story I heard when his friends joked about the lady who'd hit him, who'd cried and hugged him in the road, making sure he was okay. Or when, just three days before the bombing, a high school kid scrawled plans to shoot everyone on a bathroom stall. And so, two months before my son boards a plane to Belgium, we feed giraffes and he poses with peacocks. He wants to see reptiles and primates. His sister wants elephants, crocodiles, never stops running until she sees a baby kangaroo. We all stop and watch him hop around his mother who lays on the concrete floor, bored. He cleans her ears, jumps on her head to engage her in play and she swats him away. He is already half her size 
but clearly still a baby. He doesn't give up until finally she stands. And I say, I think he'll climb into her pouch. My son doesn't believe that Joey will fit and I tell him he will fit. And then an illusion, the pouch one minute tucked against the kangaroo's belly stretches, touches the ground as the Joey climbs in head first, shuffles and turns, settling in. After that, there is little to see. Black paws peek from the belly. The mother nibbles her fingers, drags her baby toward a food bowl, and I follow her eyes down the dark corridor toward the metal door bursting open, the light blasting in, my daughter running out into it. Yeah, and that was a newer poem. Two months before my son leaves for Belgium, we visit the zoo uh, by Angela Voris Hills. So, so Angela, tell us what, what is the next book about? Like what is, um, you know, I only have these poems that you sent here, which are great. Um, so, so what is the, what are the themes and, and, and how is the book coming together? Is it a finished manuscript already that you're shopping around or are you sort of still compiling it and, and what's it about? Yeah. Um, so I'm still working on it right now. Um, it started, uh, so it was like shortly after I kind of finished the last version of this manuscript and was like, I don't want to be sitting around not knowing what to do after this. So what else do I want to work on? And so like my mind was open to new ideas and I stumbled on this YouTube video. Um, it was like a PSA from the fifties uh, released by the department of civil defense. It was called the house in the middle. Um, and in it, this very official looking man explains that, if housewives keep their houses clean enough, they can save their families from nuclear attack, um, which is amazing yeah. on all yeah. kinds of yeah. ways, right? Mm -hmm. It's so good. And so, um, so I was thinking a lot about this idea and watched that video a lot and then kind of went down a rabbit hole and watched a lot of other similar videos. And so this new collection really, um, it's called The House in the Middle and it really focuses on ideas of like motherhood, fear, consumerism, um, kind of propaganda stuff, a little bit of all of that social media. Um, yeah, so it has a lot to do with that. And then um, in that rabbit hole, I stumbled upon these pictures from a Nevada test site called Survival Town, where and maybe, you know, from like the Indiana Jones movies, it's like all of the like houses are set up into this in this fake suburb. Um, and there are mannequins set up do like in everyday situations in this fake suburb. So when they set off nuclear bombs, they use the mannequins like to gauge how people's bodies will respond to nuclear bombs, which is yeah. also just like very rich. So anyway, so so I started writing poems about like ecrastic poems about that, those scenes of the mannequins and also like what, if we were mannequins today, like what would our mannequin situations look like? So there are a lot of like mannequin poems. There are poems about like being a mom and being terrified um, and being a mom and shopping to deal with that terror and yeah yeah the the mannequin poems really stand out how many of those do you have in the in the manuscript um i honestly don't know off the top of my head i mean i have maybe like three or four ekphrastic poems and maybe six or seven mm -hmm. so far like mannequin today poems mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's hear one of them, because it, it really, they are, they're very interesting. Sure. The mannequins sit in a sprawl of cubicles. Separated by half walls, eyes and foreheads dot the beige landscape like mole hills. They wait for phones to ring, metal headbands bending ear to ear, tiny mics near chins. They wear skirts and button-down blouses, smudged with yogurt, peanut butter, toothpaste. Pinned between copies of policy and scripts, photos hang around their monitors. Kids wearing white and denim, laughing in fields at dusk. All screens glowing, open to HR's page. Deductibles, vacation, sick days, FMLA, short-term disability. They navigate a sea mapped by blind cartographers who sit in offices with windows. 
Under desks, heels off, they update ovulation apps, scroll through baby center, check violin schedules, Pinterest, make meal plans and apps. The office hums with the white noise of planning, the effort of balancing hours that don't exist. Each desk cluttered with calendars, day planners, post-its reminding them to pick up prescriptions, leave early for the doctor, and on the wall beside the clock, a picture of the ocean at sunset reminds them to dance like no one is watching. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's uh, The Mannequin Sit in a Sprawl of Cubicles, one of these poems from the new book. Is there a title for the new book yet? Um, the house in the middle. The house. Oh, yeah, that's right. You said that. The house in the middle. Yeah. So, so, what do you think it was that drew you to the mannequins and and decided to sort of bring them to life? There's just something really fascinating about the way, especially when you talk about those public service announcements, where um they do like those old ones especially they they act like human beings aren't human and just kind of like like puppets to move around. You know, there's something really fascinating about the way that the larger body of our culture deals with individuals or something that's like wrapped up in there it is um you know there's like sort of a dehumanizing aspect to that to the whole thing um where do you remember how you got the idea to sort of bring those mannequins to life and do you, do you have any idea of what what drew you to do that um i mean i honestly think it started with just writing a few ekphrastic poems and wanting the mannequins to be doing something <laughs> like I wanted them to be anim animated I don't it felt so I don't know and just like leave it to the government to be like oh yes these mannequins are perfect stand-ins for actual human people <laughs> like oh, I don't like it was all very just like it just kind of blew my mind that this was something <laughs> that was happening I don't know yeah so I don't remember exactly when it was that I switched from like the ekphrastic poems to like other, the new, the new kind of mannequin poems. But there was a point where I was like, I don't think I can write another ekphrastic poem about this. I think it needs to be, things need to come to life and happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's just really interesting. Do you want to do another one? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the mannequin refreshes the Facebook mom group while sitting on the toilet. A pregnant woman has been reading. Childbirth sounds awful. Bringing baby home is terrifying. She wants someone to tell her it's not. Someone say it's beautiful. And they do. 97 comments gushing about the beauty, assuring her, yes, it's hard, but you will only remember the joy of those first days. They go so fast. The mannequin has had enough babies to mostly remember the awful, the weight of body after body escaping her own. She can barely read the comments without feeling cheated out of forgetting, a dense pressure between her legs. So she scrolls past them. Another mom wants recommendations for a nutritionist. Her husband won't let their toddler eat sugar, not even in fruit. And her toddler is losing so much weight so fast now that he's weaning. And that's as far as the mannequin gets before the door bursts open and a photo appears in her Facebook feed. And it's her baby a year ago. And here's her baby today. And she sees he was beautiful. The baby on the duvet stretching in his new skin, now wobbling in on chubby legs, such terrible, awful beauty. Was that? The mannequin refreshes the Facebook mom group while sitting on the toilet. Um, another really interesting poem from uh, Angela's forthcoming book or book to uh, yet their pending book, I guess we should say. Um, so, so looking at these two, you know, the, the newer poems and the, the poems from Louder Birds, do you feel like there's any kind of progression as a writer? Do you think there's some sort of things that you've learned in the process of, of uh, publishing the one book and then applying it to, to the new poems? I just, I think generally like my process is just tightened up a lot. Right. And I think that I have a better understanding of the first book was really like a collection of all the poems that I had been writing and then like adding new poems and kind of fitting it all together to make sense as a collection. Um, and this book seems to just have, I don't know if that it's necessarily that I've learned 
anything and that's why this is happening or if it's just that like this is what's happening now but um they all all of the poems do seem to be coming together around a central idea or th- kind of have they have a through line mm-hmm. to begin with as opposed to like the last book I think I had to find a through line like here it seems just to be there already and when I go to write a poem, I think like, does this relate to the manuscript? And if so, how? Not that I won't write a poem if it doesn't, but um, just kind of being mindful of how it might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems to be happening a little bit more quickly that way. Yeah. And and less collage. I mean, it's, it, you know, so if you're writing process before it was collage, how would you describe it for the more recent poems? Do you, do you, do you have the same kind of, I mean, just what's your routine like? How often do you sit down to write poems and do you know where you're going to start with? Like, do you wait for something that you want to write about? How do you know, like when it's writing time, how do you know uh, what to do? Yeah. So I am actually getting my PhD right now um, at UW-Milwaukee. And so my writing life has just like shifted dramatically. Um, my kids are in school full time now. And so I definitely have more like chunk, like I will just suddenly have a day to sit and write as opposed to these five minute here and there chunks of time. Um, So the process has definitely changed a lot. Um, I'm taking writing workshops. And so like a lot of the generation comes from reading new work. Um, And yeah, I think just like having those days at a time instead of those like moments that I'm grasping at has definitely changed the process. Mm And, and when I do sit down, I usually have kind of like a direction I'm heading in my mind before I sit down to write. And you mentioned a PhD. Is that an, in creative writing or is it in literature? Yeah. Yeah. It's an English with creative writing. Oh, yeah. that's really interesting. I wonder how, how many of, of programs are like that. Are there more and more? Um, Cause it used to be that MFA was the terminal degree, but there's a, I've seen a few PhDs now. How many, is that something that you, um, you know, looked around a lot at? Um, I, I didn't look at too many other places. We um, moved to Milwaukee in 2017, 2016. Um, and since then, I kind of always had it in my head that I would apply for the PhD program here. Um, and since we're kind of like rooted here, like if I didn't get in, then I just wasn't going to do it. Um, so I was very lucky that I got in. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I know like of a handful of other programs only because I know other people in those programs, Hmm. but I don't know how many there are out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting the way it evolves, you know? Um, And, and so um, there's a question here about the mannequin poems from Deb T. She says, what do you think it does within your creative process to have the people in your mannequin poems be mannequins instead of people? Which is an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard sometimes to remember that they're mannequins and I try to make them not actually move from where they are so that if you were to like set up the mannequins scene, it would look like one of those photos from back in the fifties. Um, and so sometimes that's tricky. Like sometimes it's hard to just be looking at the, the external and maybe focusing like on internal thinking and stuff, but like trying to make it so nobody's actually moving Mm. is true yeah that would be yeah um and so so as far as like writing a poem goes um what what would you say your goal is do you have an audience in mind do you think that you're trying to entertain people with your poems are you focused on just exploring something yourself and you know come what may um how much of that goes into in the process of crafting poems how much do you think of the audience i don't think about the audience until like the very, very end. Usually my writing process is just me trying to figure something out. Um, Like me getting an image stuck in my head and trying to figure out like, why is that sticking there? And and like, what about it? Like, I don't know, like there's something there, but what is it? Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's me just kind of parsing out what it is and then from there, like taking a step back and like, okay, does anybody else understand what I'm saying here? And is this something anybody else would be interested in reading? Right. Because like I definitely have a lot of poems that are just kind of scrapped after I work them out. And mm-hmm. um, yeah. 
And do you save the the scraps? Because um, I always think about how um, um, Janet Fitch said she has like drawers of kind of folders of different images that she can kind of thumb through when she needs one. Do you, and and since your your writing is even the newer poems are very image based. Um, do, do you have do you save stuff like that and sort of have a, a cache of images somewhere that you can draw from? I. <sighs> It's so, it's irritating because I do save them, but like, I don't know where I've ever saved anything. (laughs) I used to write like in notebooks. So I have all of my old notebooks, but I've never looked through them again. And I have like many different folders called notes. (laughs) Like I have no idea where anything would be. Um, But I do feel also like if something's been missing for that long, kind of like the, like how, if a book has been like, it's been a while since I wrote this book, I feel like those images kind of lose their electricity or like their urgency. And so I I generally try to find new things. And I struggle when I go back and look at old things to like put them into any like current context. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, if anybody has any questions for Angela, please leave them in the chat windows. I mean, WTS1, Um, you can leave them in the chat windows on either Facebook or YouTube and I'll pass them along. if you uh, if you leave them on Twitter though, I'm not looking at Twitter, so find YouTube or Facebook and uh, and leave them there. Uh, but let's hear another poem in the meantime, Angela. Tim, are you there? You froze yeah. on me. Oh, you froze okay. for a second. But you're good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, do you want to do another poem? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um. My mother, the mannequin. Of course, before me, my mother was a mannequin. Most photos destroyed per her request. Jeans pulled too tight around her waist. Shoulder pads unbearable. Eyeshadow blue to her brow. Perm too tight. I still see her though, just like that and pushing the lawnmower through the backyard ditch in dirty white sneakers, brushing barbecue sauce on chicken at the grill, sobbing at the kitchen table because the girl cut her hair too short. I should have taken photos and hidden them of her singing to Abba in the neon light of the bar, shooting arrows at a doe target in the basement, holding that bow steady. Now we take pictures all the time. Here we are making candy, all the recipes her mother made. And here we are making pierogi, like my great grandma on Christmas Eve. In each photo, she wears a dark scarf around her head. It trails long behind her, tethering her to the earth. And that was another mannequin poem. That was uh, My Mother the Mannequin uh, from a a forthcoming book by Angela Voris Hills. And um, so you mentioned, Angela, um, reading a lot of contemporary poets now um, through the program and stuff. Who, um, you know, I I don't know. I feel always like I'm a little bit out of the loop because I just read submissions. And then, like, everything is built off submissions. So people don't submit poems. I don't know what's going on. Um, What do you what do you find? You know, what was the most recent book you read that was? fascinating and and why was it fascinating um i mean so we read recent i read recently um frank sonnets by by diane seuss and of course like that just is amazing um what else did we read lately um i feel like i've read so many things since i've read poetry (laughs) like i've been reading so many fiction books lately um but ghost of by oh who is that is it Diane Conwin, maybe her I'm name. Not familiar with that one. Ghost Up. It's an amazing book. I've been reading a lot of like hybrid stuff. Um, uh, Diane also... Conwin is who who that is. Ghost yes, Up. Thank Interesting. You. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful, like it's a gorgeous book. Um, what else did we read lately? Um, yeah, those are the two that come to mind. I've been really interested in. Um, oh man, is Monica Ong? um is like a hybrid poet who i was really who i'm really into um yeah i I feel like i feel like i've been doing a lot of hybrid poetry reading um 
I don't, I'm drawing a complete blank right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so do I, because I don't know. I don't know who the last week's guest was. I always forget that. So I hear you. Um, um, so, so, I mean, we people keep talking about in the chat windows just how image rich your poems are again. Um, and, and that's just something that really stands out. And I'm wondering how you move between images, because that's one of the things that people sort of even when they write really good images and sort of set a scene, they have trouble shifting. And I guess maybe I'm talking in the third third person about myself, um, but uh, have trouble shifting to like new scenes. And there's this way that your poems, they kind of move in this sort of dreamlike way where like things can shift into a totally new space without a lot of transition. And you're just kind of like moving into these new scenes. And since they're so vividly told, there's always like a connection. You never feel really lost, but but there's always this like sense of freedom of movement throughout all the image rich poems. Um, is there is there a way that you do that? Like how when you how do you go from one one image to the next? Yeah, that's actually I mean, that's my favorite thing. Like that is the thing that I love to try to figure out. Um, so I don't know that that I can explain how I do it, except that it is it is like my favorite thing to do. So like, I love to have images, like it's part of that collage process where I'm like, how do all of these fit together? And then like, how can I make it so that it actually makes sense that these things go together? Um, because I do think that the, that like that randomness is just such a real part of being alive, like mm -hmm. to have, two things that seem like they shouldn't go together going together is, um, is, is like a real energy for me. I don't know. And so like making that work is where I find the mo most joy in creating poetry. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, it's not really dream necessarily. It's that state right as you fall asleep, you know, where you're like, you're suddenly talk thinking about something completely different. And then, you know, you get that awareness of like, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, yeah. there's that, that sense of it throughout uh, for the book and then the newer poems too. Um, so, uh, there are a couple of questions from, from Ellen McCarthy, um, uh, over on Facebook. She's asking about, first of all, um, any way about, do you have a, a method for finding fresh metaphors? Are metaphors something you think about a lot in your, in your writing process and, and how do you come up with them if so? Yeah, honestly, I am terrible at metaphors. <laughs> I'm, I'm always like reading poems with great metaphors and just very confused about how people are making that happen. I actually would just really love to be met better at metaphors. Um, like the only good metaphors I think I've ever come up with generally have been from like writing prompts where I'm like prompted to come up with a metaphor some in like some way. And then I'm like, oh, that's actually a great metaphor. And then like I can squeeze that into a poem or like it's one of the, you know, one of the collage pieces <laughs> on my list of like things to cram into a poem. Um, but otherwise I feel like I'm generally just not good at it unless I have again like just an image floating around and an idea on the same page and I'm like oh maybe I can cram these things together but other <laughs> otherwise I'm just very jealous of good metaphor makers yeah well it's, it's funny because we have that Neil Postman award for metaphor and I'm gonna have to read through all everything we've published last year really soon like next week because I, I just realized as I'm putting together the spring issue that there's a spot to announce it and I have to like figure out who to announce. And but every year that we do that, I'm reminded of how difficult metaphor is, even in you know in, in all poetry. But to have something really fresh and unique is really rare. Like there's, you know, a handful of poems that that stand out as something that have them. But most of them, um, you know, don't move through metaphor a lot, and more more through scene and cadence and, and and voice and things like that. So it's really interesting to talk about metaphor. Just it's so difficult to do, and it feels though at the same time it's like the fundamental unit of poetry in a way. So it's, it's fascinating. Um, the, the other question from Ellen was about the shapes of poems. And, and if we look through the book, there are a whole bunch of, um, through Louder Birds, there are a whole bunch of different poems that have sort of, they sort of develop their own forms um, of, of shape on the page, of stanza, like, like these. I'll just, I'll just show a couple. Um, but, you know, there's different, different ways to run through poems. How do you come up with those shapes? And, and what is the determining factor around um, how to shape a poem once you sort of have the, cause I assume you don't, I mean, I assume I have no idea, but I assume that you don't sort of write the poem out with like, you know, like three line stanzas where there's an indentation every time. And then, you know, like, like one of these where it's sort of weaving back and forth, um, you know, between these, um, you know, three line stanzas. Um, so how do you come up with a shape? How do you know what feels right for a poem? Um, so yeah, sometimes they actually do start that way, just because that's how they like the kind of indent, indent, indent 
like typewriter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sometimes they do just sound that way to me in my head, but usually that happens at the end um, when I read a poem out loud and it just doesn't sound right. I just start messing with the indentations or the line breaks or the stanza breaks. Um, and then from there, like that really, that's, I mean, that's most of my revision process starts with line work like that. So when I shift a line around, oftentimes it'll make me change an end word or oftentimes it'll make me recognize like, oh, that's the same word twice now. Like, cause I see them differently. Um, so I just play around a lot with lines when I think I'm close to done as like a big step in my revision process. Mm -hmm. um, and then I generally end wherever it makes the most like lyrical sense and the pauses sound right and the spacing sounds right. Um, yeah. So it, it's really about just like pacing and breath. Mm -hmm. How much do you think the white space around poems is a factor? Because what that does is add a sort of a sense of roominess. You know, when you have the, the, the stanzas that move sort of in and out of different spaces and sort of use up the whole paper, you end up with a kind of a lot more white space. Do you think that is one of the effects that you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think as far as definitely, like just a little bit of extra silence, I think can sometimes help stabilize an image so that if you have white space on you know both sides you can kind of ground the image in that space between the white space right and then you have a moment before you move to the next line and have to kind of jump into the next image maybe it kind of prepares your mind for gives you just gives you some time to sit there right with an image mm -hmm. before moving on one yeah interesting well i think you have the poem haunted here it's a newer one that you sent let's do that poem so you can see how the that the white space feels and then i want to finish out with one last poem from louder birds too if you don't mind because um uh i feel like we gave it the short shrift we were you know talking about how much the mannequins were interesting but but i want to do a little more louder birds too but maybe a question or two in between so let's do the haunted poem next sure <clears throat> haunted Living alone, I'd call my mom, make her listen as I moved room to room, looking in closets, behind doors, under the bed, anywhere a man could fit. I plugged my curling iron in each day before showering, imagined identifying a man in a lineup by his melted cheek, his missing eye. By then I'd seen enough Law and order reruns to play each scene out until sentencing. Ever since I was a kid, I've wanted things to be fair, believed hand on my heart and liberty and justice for all, but I've also been so afraid, mostly of a death I'd have to live through, drowning, fire, kidnapping that ends with me tied up in a hole filling with dirt. My daughter is scared of ghosts, believes they're in each corner of her dark room. I tell her they're not real. But once playing Ouija at a cabin with cousins, we contacted the blue ghost and the light above us flickered blue, burnt out, left us in dark woods alone. So who's to say? I've never walked through a haunted house, staged or otherwise, but my cousin pissed her pants inside one, left a puddle someone had to clean. One year, the gun club sponsored a haunted hayride, and I rode through the forest, hay splintering my ass through jeans, and when a man jumped out of the dark with a chainsaw buzzing at us, I thought, God, who knows if this is really part of it? Who gets paid to behave this way? This was years before a man shot into a crowded concert from a hotel window in Vegas and before so many defended his right to do so. I watch TV, try to believe these stories are fictional and do not depict any actual person or event. My daughter asks about monsters and I say they're not real, but news breaks and she knows I'm lying. If ghosts are real, what do they expect from a four-year-old? By now, 
You'd think we'd all have heard the unsettled dead. You'd think something would be different. Yeah, and that was Haunted, another newer poem from Angela Voris Hills. And um, so, so do you have, um, you know, as you shop around the book, um, how much, is it, is it feel the same way shopping around a book before, or is there some kind of difference between having a new book and then, uh, you know, having it be your second book? Is there something you've learned in the process or? Um... Well, I haven't finished this one yet. So uh-huh. it's like not near, so I'm not quite there yet, but I'm slightly terrified of, <laughs> of doing that whole thing over again. Like, I don't know if like, contests are the way to go with a second like I don't know what to do with a second book I I feel very well versed in all of the things to do with the first book <laughs> I mm-hmm. spent a long time doing it um yeah so I don't I haven't given it a lot of thought yet I've even like had a harder time for my first book most of those poems in the collection have been published places um and so for the second book like I haven't had a lot of time to send stuff out and um Yeah. So I just, I feel very behind with publishing generally with this thing and more focused just on kind of trying to write it and do PhD work and all of that. So, Mm -hmm. and also just kind of catching up with like normal life after COVID Mm -hmm. or like after the big, (laughs) the big part of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, It is. It just, it keeps coming back to me just how, the, the publishing, the way we go out publishing stuff doesn't seem quite right, you know, that you have all these poems and then you have to do so much legwork to get them out. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, you're, you're talking about kids a lot, your, your, your children. And um, do they write poems? Is that something that you sort of do with them? I'm always curious about that because of the, our Young Poets anthology. It's always so fun to work with them. Is that something that, that you sort of pass on? Is there another generation down there? Yeah. I mean, so my son, he's 23, so he's not like totally a young poet anymore, but he's, he's a songwriter and he's an artist. He does like everything except technically write poems. Uh (laughs) Um, Of course. Um, Yeah. And then my younger kids aren't actually that they're both visually, like they're both interested in visual art, pretty hardcore, but not so much poetry yet. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, probably because I do it, right? Nobody wants to do what their parents are doing. It's very uncool. Well, that, that sort of reminds me of something I'm going to ask about. With, with how visually strong your poems are, is, the, is there any way you've ever been drawn to visual art in, you know, instead of poetry? Is there a reason why it's words painting a picture rather than like a brush or a, a sculpture or something like that? Um, I just, I don't think, I always thought I was very bad at art and So I never, I mean, I don't remember taking any art course. Like, I don't know why I think I'm really bad at art. Um, But I always was just under the assumption that I was very bad at art. And so I never even really tried it. Um, And yeah, I don't know. Poetry makes a lot of sense to me now that I've like, gotten so into it. But I haven't like my, my interest in hybrid poetry has like I've been doing a lot of like more visual poetry, I guess. Like I've been putting things like, yeah, like physical, visual, collage poetry stuff. Mm-hmm. I've been working on some other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Because I've been just thinking about the, the, especially the mannequin poems where you're like describing the layout and you just have to keep that in your head as they like move around but don't. There's like a whole model of a map. It's very like visual spatial intelligence oriented. So you know, the, the, the idea of, of playing with actual 3D space in addition to describing it is, is really interesting. How, how do your, what do your visual poems look like? What do you, I mean, you didn't send an example, so I can't show it, but what, what are you doing with it? Like, is it a, is it, is it photography and, and that kind of thing, or is it all text? Um, well, yeah, so one of the projects is, um, it, so during, in 2020, my mom also passed away. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about um, nuclear attack and reading a lot of these like old, like how to survive nuclear attack brochures from the 50s. And one of them was like how to survive and how to survive an, an atomic attack or something like that. And I did an erasure of it um, using pink ribbon or like breast cancer and kind of I, I did an erasure using the pink ribbon and kind of equating the chances of surviving a nuclear attack and the chances of surviving breast cancer. Um, so kind of looking at the relationship between those two 
kind of statistically weird situations where like nobody really knows how likely it is or like when it will hit or right so there was so kind of grappling with both of those things simultaneously um I did another like a palimpsest where it was like um one giant block of text on printed on vellum and then just some of the words from the first one so like an erasure with like just some of the words bleeding through on top of it so there are kind of a stack of vellum pages each one has its own little poem that's just been erased from that main text so oh, you can kind of yeah mm -hmm. ghost of all of them through it um yeah it's kind of I mean it's tricky to describe yeah that, that sounds really I mean while you're so good at describing things it was described really vividly I think um yeah that sounds really fascinating yeah uh interesting to play with that kind of thing um, just one quick question from Ted Guevara before we do one last poem. Um, uh, Ted Guevara asks, how long did that zoo poem take you to write? Uh, that was optimal, a real book bait, he calls it. He really wants to read the next book. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's something we didn't talk about, is how, how, much, you know, how much time goes into a poem on average, would you say, in, in that poem in particular, if you remember? Yeah, I mean, that poem in particular actually was very fast. That was a quick one. I mean, I... I hope that every poet has had the experience of like the poem came to me, right? Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. one where the poem pretty much came to me. I mean, I think that I probably had some notes about like my son getting hit by that car and, um, you know, and my son running around the third floor roof because. Mm -hmm seriously um so I had like some, some things in mind right yeah. um but then like the experience at the zoo like that happened and like that's the bulk of the of the poem and it came to me at the zoo and I, I sat down and after the zoo and I wrote it um but I was also like I have a series of poems whose titles are like so many days after this happens we do this or like so many days before this we do this um so there's kind of a series of poems that have a similar title like that um so it kind of it fell into that series yeah yeah interesting uh well let's finish up with one last poem what do you want to read I, I think we should go back to the book just so we uh you know we want people to buy the book so yeah, yes um i don't know what's a good what's a good bookseller um let's see <laughs> like, um... <laughs> uh, what i really i liked bake sales Oh, okay. I'm always I'm always very excited to hear what other people are interested in because it's never what I imagine people are interested in. So I'm like, oh, you like that? I'm so glad. All right. Bake sales. We brought guns to the firehouse bake sale, shot into the eroded hill, bought carrot cake with cream cheese frosting, snow forced everything from the walls. We caught the carpet mouse, left him asleep in a box with crayoned windows. At church, the priest must have said something before we sang hallelujah. Our hands must have been cold, even in mittens. Climbing into the truck, frost snagged our tights and dresses, our bodies smashed together on vinyl seats for warmth. We raced to the front porch to lick the icicle hanging from gutter to ground, found Amy laughing in the doorway wearing jeans, her purple socks sinking in the burnt orange shag with olive freckles. Amy is always in the doorway laughing. In the front yard snow, the mouse's blood is always red. We waited inside until sunshine, grass, then ice melted in our lemonade cooler. Some men gave us $5 for a Dixie cup full and drove away waving their lips wet. Yeah, and that was Bake Sales, another poem from Louder Birds by Angela Voris Hills. Angela, thanks so much for being a guest. It was great talking to you and, and looking at the, both this book and, and what you're working on now. Um, yeah, thanks for being a guest and, and appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Take care. It was Angela too, Forest thanks. Hills um, and Louder Birds, of course, was the book we were looking at. Um, Angela Voris, you can find her uh, website at um, just like it sounds, or just like it's spelled Angela. 
It's A N G E L A, Voris, V O R A S, Hills. Dot com. So find Louder Birds and a lot more at uh, AngelaVorisHills.com. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to um, our main guest. Actually, we're not going to go quick break. Let's just jump right over because Clint is here. And uh, hey, Clint, can you unmute and turn on your camera? There you hey, go. how's it going? Hey, Clint. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a long time, actually. How's it been? Good, good. Yeah, just uh, hanging in there. We have... Rain in Southern California. So yeah, I was going to tell, I meant to tell everybody just in case, because we up in the mountains here, the wind is howling and we have these, uh, the ground is saturated. We have these like 200 foot Jeffrey pines that are just like swaying everywhere. And if one falls on a power line, there goes the power for the whole town. So if I disappear, that's why <laughs> it probably didn't land on me. The odds are low, but uh, although not zero. And um, and that's why that, that there's just no power. But um, but yeah. So down there, it must be pouring because I saw the radar coming in, and that's where it's coming from. Yeah, it's been. I love it. I love it. Yeah. People in Southern well, California. You're in the, you're you're in the wrong place if you love it, my yeah, friend. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so so tell me about so visitor is your uh, your new book which just came out. Um, tell me about it. What what is uh? Because I haven't had a chance to really look at it much, but I know your work really well. Of course, your style. Uh, what is what is visitor about? How did the collection come together? And and what can you tell us about it? Well, um, I've heard you on a few like recent podcasts um, talking with some other poets and. Um, Kind of about, uh, you know, I don't come up with a theme or anything for my my books. Uh I just, uh, they're a collection of poems that I've written in the last, you know, few years or whatever. So um, I really don't, you know, I've tried it once. I set out to write a book of poems around a theme and it was really boring. So, um, (laughs) so yeah, I, I don't have any, you know, there's not like some thematic objective here other i mean the title visitor of course so many things could be that metaphorically Mm -hmm. um so i do think that the poem sort of could fit with that um but yeah i you know i always think about more about the individual poem than about the the book itself so i don't set out to ever write a book of poems Mm -hmm. i just set out to write individual poems yeah uh, well well, let's hear one and then yeah let's hear one then we'll talk a little bit more yeah um Let's see. Why don't I start with uh, one that Rattle published and that you posted today, actually, which is, um, why don't I just go right to death, you know, in the beginning. So um, it's called When Death Travels. And what page? Oh, sorry. uh, 83. Okay. When Death Travels. No one makes him take take his shoes off at security or asks to see his boarding pass. There are no bags to check because baggage is strictly for the living. No windows on the plane because there's nothing to see. No seatbelts because there's nothing to impact. The flight attendants attend to nothing. And though there are delays, there are never any cancellations. No one greets him at the gate or holds a sign with his name. No one is happy to see him. And that is uh, When Death Travels, a poem from Rattle originally and also in Visitor, Clint Margrave's newest book. And it's interesting what these, you know, you say that it's a collection of poems and you focus on the individual poems. But what's always fascinating to me when looking back at poems in a group is that you always find that you have your own topics that you're sort of obsessed with and you can't get over. You have certain kind of, you know, images that keep coming up that you're sort of like, it's like your subconscious just can't like shake it and you're trying to like figure out what's going on. Um, when you looked back at the collection, was there something like that that you you thought of? It, it's like something like I keep writing about these like this kind of thing in common. Is is there something in there or not? You, we talk about yeah. people, you know, having just collections of homes, but I don't know how, frankly, it's possible <laughs> to not have your like oh, you're right. you're subconscious right. I mean, I re- interject and make make themes on their own. Yeah, I, I have recurring themes. One of them is death, which is maybe something I should. I don't know. I, I was just thinking I should branch out a little bit uh, in the. <laughs> So my new poems, well, I actually have a bunch that still deal with death, but uh, I'm like, okay, no more of, the, no more of these. I'm, my old teenage goth uh, years need to be um, buried, I guess. But um, So, yeah, I mean, obviously, theme, themes emerge. Uh, you know, you can find, you can throw a bunch of poems together and find interlinking themes in, you know, in, in any collection. I don't like organizing these books because I, <laughs> you know, it's just always, so this one's alphabetical. Yeah, um, I noticed that. I but noticed that's that. very interesting because that actually creates weird, you know, weird connections between the poems. And um, 
so I found it, you know, it was it was an experiment for me, but I found it interesting. And it's really easy at readings. <laughs> Because yeah. I can find the poem very easy, so, you know. Yeah, that's what we, you know, we do uh, alphabetical by last name in Rattle. And it's the same kind that's of right. thing. It's like you can flip to it quick, but also there's weird ways that it, the randomness, sort of the order pulls itself out of the chaos and it comes, becomes interesting and the, and the nuances shifting between different poems, I always find. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I, I was so, so we're, uh, this is a day, I think one of your favorite poets died, unfortunately, Charles Simich. Um, can you talk a little bit about like who influenced? I know I know Lachlan influenced you in a great deal on um, Jerry and uh, Bukowski. Um, what what was it uh, the the poets that you fell in love with that made you want to be a writer? And then and how did Simic fit in there? Um, I think you know I heard earlier you were talking about uh, white space on a on a page and like I like this sort of short simplistic um, type of writing. You know I. I I don't like long poems. I don't like when I look at a page, it's just like a block of text, you know, even though I read tons of novels, but if I want to read a novel, read a novel. So I like the way that they, people like Simich and, and Lachlan, um, what they, even though Lachlan has some very long poems, but, and so does Simich, but uh, what they can do with just a small amount of words. And um, I just find it very powerful and just the, 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 the brevity and um, the cleanliness of the line um so i i just aspire to that i mean it's not conscious i just think it's in it. like that last poem i just read i was realizing today like wow this is it is like something you know not i'm not comparing myself as, as far as quality but i'm just saying that you know i was like well this is kind of like something simage might do or something like that um but you know it just happens to unintentionally i suppose but mm -hmm. uh, certainly the influence and uh keeping the line neat in, in that way. I think I think the last time we were on, um, I think uh, it was way back in episode 24, so it was a long time ago, you either were just about to publish a novel or just had, right? Was that, what What year did that novel come out? 2020. Yeah, yeah. okay, there you go, the 2020, <laughs> the I curse think, of 2020 I, for Yeah, authors. I think, uh, I think our rattle cast was in January 2020. Mm -hmm. My novel was coming out in May 2020, so, gotcha. and yeah. it did. No. Uh, so so what was your experience like that as, as opposed to publishing because that's your first novel i think right yeah so what was yeah. your experience like that as opposed to publishing books was it much different or was it the similar kind of vibe I, I know the covid throws it all off but yeah it was it was a weird time to be able to have any objective point of view about that but it seemed like people are a little more interested in i mean you know we always joke about how marginalized poetry is and mm -hmm. I, there's some truth to that maybe um I did feel like people were more excited, but um, I still think I prefer poetry, but um, <laughs> I do both, but not, you know, I'm mostly focusing on poetry these days, but yeah, it did seem like um, there was some more interest, but uh, I don't know. It was May, 2020, and I, you know, <laughs> the book launch was on Zoom, you know, uh -huh. and we were all hunkered down, so yeah, it was yeah. a weird time to, but I actually, thought maybe it was a good time what else can you do but read exactly you know? yeah i mean it was a great time for poetry that's for sure i, mean, I was like, i'm still catching up from all the, yeah. the the pandemic era submissions and we have uh I, i'm working on our our spring issue right now and the poems in the open section for that were submitted during early covid like that's how like that you know that's how much delay we just got so many and you know you don't want to pass on great poems so you're just like well if you want to wait that long <laughs> here you go yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so let's finish up with one, one other poem from the book. What else do you want to read? Okay. Um, I'll read a poem called, um, once I shared a wall with God, which is on page 63. Okay. Once I shared a wall with God, I could hear him vacuuming late at night. Who does that? He was constantly rearranging furniture, opening and closing drawers, sliding hangers in the closet, banging things around. I never really heard his voice because he lived alone, occasionally just the deep rumble of him clearing his throat. It's not his fault, I told myself. The walls are thin. The floors crack at every step. The rooms are echo chambers. I can adjust. In the mornings, it was silent. God liked sleeping in. But at night, I cursed the world until I finally had to confront him. 
I thought about leaving a letter to spare us both the awkward conversation, but I wanted to make sure he understood. I'll be nice, I said as I rang his bell, but if it keeps on happening, I'll have to tell the landlord. Nervous as I was, I wanted God to know he'd been a bad neighbor, that he had little regard for others, that this universe was something we both shared. I'm sorry, I wanted to hear him say. I'm so sorry, but nobody answered the door. Yeah, another great poem. That was uh, Once I Shared a Wall with God from Clint Margrave's newest book, Visitor. Thanks so much for joining us, Clint, and sharing this new book and send me a copy. I hope everybody picks up a copy of it out there. And uh, good to see you. All right, good to see you, and thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And stay dry out there. I just, the wind blew so hard just a second ago that the house actually shook. <laughs> so, stay safe. I don't know. Yes, yeah, stay safe. <laughs> don't get the storm surge, you know, whatever you are down in Long Beach. Uh, take care, Clint. All right, have a good one. Yep, you too. That was Clint Margrave uh, with Visitor, his newest book. And uh, we are going to go to open lines now. So uh, I'm going to take a quick break. And uh, let's see, to tell you how to do open lines, though, would be a good thing, I assume. And what you want to do is, so I'm going to put this up on the screen. So first, go to open mic, or actually email your poem to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Email me the poem there. And uh, that way I can show it on the screen like I do for everybody else. Only if you want to share poems, don't. If you want to uh, just listen and watch and enjoy poetry, sit tight right where you are. But if you want to share a poem, email it first to open mic, open M-I-C at rattle.com, and then find the Zoom links. I'm copying and pasting them into the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube. You can join us on Zoom and share a poem or two, depending on how many people uh, pile on here right now. Um, here it is on, on Facebook. We'll pin that comment at the top, and here it is on YouTube. Come on over, and we will share poems. We can have poems about current events. We can have poems about the prompt, which we'll talk about a little bit. We can have poems uh, that you've published recently. It's always fun to look at other magazines and see what we've got. So anything you'd like to share, please hop over on the open lines and share it right now. I'll be right back in just a moment with all of that. So hang out, and I will see you in just a second. And we're back. Um, as I mentioned, the prop poem um, had to do with last week's guest. Um, um, Emily Ruth Hazel is the owner and, and founder of Wild Honey Words. And she gave us a scavenger hunt to do. Let me pull this up. If you missed it, um, what it was is you create a list based on um, what she's got here, based on your birthday. I'll put this on the screen right now. Um, so, so my birthday was uh, is in June. So, so I had the May and June list. And then what you're supposed to do is go through the uh, search, search bar and find, uh, find words on her website that have those, uh, or, or pages on the website that have those words, and then double the list size by adding some extra words, some verbs in particular, from those pages to match the words. So we came up with a list, and I don't know if I wrote my list down, actually. But my list, I have steel, gift, transport, which I shifted, flavor, long, and then I came up with some other words too to fit the prompt, um, you know, to fit that from other pages. And I came up with this poem right here. This is uh, concerning the steel. Concerning the steel. The truth is, 
It wasn't a gift from the gods, not really. It was all effort on our part as they hovered above in their hummingbird drones. We cut the rock and crushed the ore, fed the dust into tumbling drums. We built the furnace, coked the coal, filled it with sinter and lime. They laughed at our hands and hot faces, our gloves and our tongs and our goggles, as we ladled the liquid into molds, as it cooled in slabs still too lurid to touch. Only then, as we scrubbed the scale and cold-rolled the plates, did they start to look greedy. Their tiny lips seemed to curl with a flavor. It tastes like cheese, one finally says, if only you fools could chew it. That is my concerning the steel. I think the other words were curled, um, flavor, I had to get in there, and uh, ladle, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, that is my poem, Concerning the Steel. Let's see what everybody else has out there. Let's go first. I'll just go in the order people arrived. I think we could do, well, now we have 10. Maybe, like, we'll do, like, two shorter ones or one longer one. Two page max. That's what we'll do today. But we'll go in the order people showed up. And Katie Dozier is first. Hello, Katie. How are you doing? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm doing good. So what do you have for us? Did you do the prompt? I did do the prompt. I attempted the prompt. I was a little bit intimidated by the dance moves, but we don't have to do the dance moves. Oh, my gosh. I totally, I just blew it. I was going to pretend I did the dance moves, (laughs) but I didn't even read them. I'll be like. Yeah. (laughs) I did. One I of walked. My words was recycle. I, I walked the dog. It, well, like I looked at the list, walked the dog <laughs> before the rain came. And then, you know, maybe like a robot type dance as I walked and was blown by the wind. Maybe. So <laughs> anyway, um, so, so do you remember your words or do you want to just jump into the poem? I really should have segregated off my words. I fear that how I did with the prompt, the words might be clear. Like polyester is not probably a word. <laughs> <laughs> normally be putting in a phone but i thought it would be fun so i'm gonna go ahead and uh try it although it is funny that you and clint margrave were talking about short poems because this is actually the longest poem i've written in a while given that i tend to write short poems but um it's not true. that long never be scared <laughs> everybody's be worried <laughs> three okay. pages of poems but okay go ahead whenever right. you got it up okay ready green city you slip and slide in the orange vinyl seat of a city bus a polyester person, you do not see the windows crack, but hear someone else's ready whistle, a map overlaid on rented time, a credit card parked hot inside your mind, blowing by the bubbles of every city you could ever know are raised like the bump where you smacked your head on the back door. Sprinting on asphalt spurs a flow of faces, on your feet recycled tire treads bouncing on the curb by a crosswalk, black and white, but then the light is green and so you go chasing all that is unknown. Excellent. Yeah, great poem. That was uh, Thanks. Ready Green City. And we should say that Katie and I are doing a, um, a, a, a space on Twitter. So if you're <laughs> on Twitter, um, it's a, a, the poetry space. going to be Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon my time, a uh, two-year time, so it's all confusing. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about poetry for an hour. And the spaces are really neat because they're this sort of um, really free-flowing kind of like like phone call chat thing, like a group call that everybody can talk about. So we're going to talk about a topic every week. I'm really easy on my end because you're picking the topics and um, that's going to be a lot of fun, but it's a, a merging of um, traditional poetry publishing and, and newer ways of publishing poems, NFTs in particular. So we're kind of mixing those audiences and seeing what goes on. But uh, look for that on Twitter. Uh, you can find Katie Dozier at Katie underscore Dozier. That's D-O-Z-I-E-R. And uh, me at Timothy Green, we both post the thing. So, so show up there if anybody is on Twitter and like to do that. But uh, I'll see you on Thursday, Katie. And uh, the topic Great. for this Thanks week so was oh, origin stories, how we, how we became um, you know, interested in, the, in dis- different digital publishing. So see that and, and everybody can contribute to. Uh, that'll be fun. Yeah, definitely. Come on by. And I now, last week was our first week. And now I feel like I actually know how to add speakers. So if you want to speak in the space, Please come and I'll actually be able to add you this week. I think. I think. I don't know. I seem like you did a great job last week because we had we had plenty of speakers and uh, it was a good a good conversation. Right? It was really a fun way to do it because there's no there's a way that this Zoom is a little intimidating because you have to get more technology involved and you have to have the camera and and you know it's like more steps. But the 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 mm-hmm. space was really neat because it was so simple and so um, so yeah. I kind of liked that. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, stay safe in the wind. You've got to make it to the next space. Yeah, that's true. I don't want so. a tree falling on me. If, we, <laughs> yeah, if I don't show up the safe. space, you'll know that I'm smushed. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Katie. Okay, I'll see you, see you on Thank Thursday. you. Yep. Bye. Bye. 
It's uh, Katie Dozier with a Ready Green City. Next up is Carla Schwartz. Hi. Hey, uh, Carla. How are you doing? I'm okay. Um, it's a wonderful night, as usual. Uh, and I, my piece is... I like got stuck on the dance, I think. So you guys are going to just have to <laughs> yeah. get up and dance while I'm doing okay. this. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, <laughs> this, I'll, put the, I'll put it on you, but then I'll be dancing off camera and everybody will. That's right. That's you know. fine. That's okay. fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. So I guess my title is Recycled Plastic Whimsy. Are you ready? Are you ready for the city? Ready? Are you ready for the city? Are you ready for the city? Gonna flow, gonna flow with it. Gonna flow, gonna flow with it. Don't you know you can flow? Don't you know you can flow? When you're blue, let me tell you. When you're blue, don't be sad. Don't be sad. I can tell you, you'll be glad to have the recyclability. Recyclability. Yes, you can take it over and over. Take your plastic. Don't you throw away your plastic. Recycle it. Recycle it. Make a tote bag from your plastic. You don't know what to carry with you. Take your blues out of the bag. Remove the blues and put in what you want like some honey. What about the sweet taste of honey? Bring it to your honey. You might make it money, but never mind. Don't make money, just be honey. And you might be able to dance and dance and dance with whimsy, whimsy. Whimsy, if you don't know what it takes to remove the blues from your tote, you won't know if you are ready to remove the blues from your tote and you take them out to recycle to the recycle bin because the blues might come again and again and again. You might just flow away down the river when the hook arrives to scoop you up from the river you don't know what to do when you are there and you feel blue, but we know that you can't forget that somewhere you'll find the flow from and from it you will stick to, stick your tongue to, listen to your honey. Well, that was very interesting, Carla. That made me, I was dancing in my seat. I couldn't help it. That first page for sure. Um, oh, so, thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank I was you. Got, got a little thank wiggle you. on. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. And that's all I got out of this. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> well, wait, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, that incorporated the dance and the rhythm for sure. That was interesting. I, ho I wonder what anybody else is going to do. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. That was great. Thank yeah. you. Have Bye -bye. a good night. It was Carla Schwartz with Recycled Plastic Whimsy. The thing, the words are very um, ad copy-ish, you know, because they're, you know, it's the products. And so um, it's interesting what, you know, trying to come up with poems based around those words. And uh, Carla definitely did. Let's see. Next up, we have uh, Mary Ann Abdo. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Mary Ann? Good, good. So mine's Poets Respond. Okay. And it's called the lore of C-SPAN. Whoever knew C-SPAN would be like the biggest piece of news going. They covered the, you know, the speaker vote after vote over and over again. That's interesting. So, Cause you know what? I was looking to see if Angela, I think Angela, yeah, Angela wrote a poem, I think about the, the same topic of C-SPAN being actually fascinating. Um, and I watched it for years. Yeah, and yeah, I I I feel like I left. I missed out. I remember that soccer match that was so great, the World Cup finals. I missed that, and I missed the the great uh, the great Kevin McCarthy thing. Whatever. <laughs> I feel like I missed all the great TV of the year already. It was over and over again. It's like <laughs> stop. So so, did you send it to me, or should I look it up on the? I sent it to you. Oh, you emailed it, it to me too. It was in with the poets okay. respond. Yeah, should I look at the poets respond, or should I look at um? It was in poets respond. Okay. I didn't send it till late Saturday. Okay, I got you. Okay, here we go. So this okay. is the the allure of C-SPAN, right? Yes. Okay. Fifteen rounds of never-ending politics, and two new players have emerged: C-SPAN and Kevin McCarthy. C-SPAN is no longer the boring channel. 
Now the news media outlet luminary of moment by moment political coverage. The battle of all battles in electing the 55th Speaker of the House. An all encompassing virtual boost from the mundane to the center of the political theater arena for all of America. Glued to our screens, a C-SPAN covered every nuance from the fashions of the house clerk, showing the facial expressions of political foes and their highs and their lows, skinning over casual conversations with Democrats and Republicans as to who will win the vote after agonizing vote counts. C-SPAN, I must admit, I loved you all along with interviews for my history-based mind, C-SPAN, my, your previous coverage on the Senate floor has filled my inquiring mind. C-SPAN, you have captured the general populace's attention by blowing up YouTube, Twitter, and other social platforms of 1.5 million daily views. Envisioning that podium announcement, the winner for this year's best new drama coverage, C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I really way to make me feel like I left missed out even more. Thanks. <laughs> really, <laughs> no problem. I wish I was, what was I doing Friday night where I couldn't watch the the all the action? I don't know. I, nobody told me either. Like where was everybody telling me to go turn on C SPAN? I don't know. I'm telling you now. <laughs> yeah, a little late. <laughs> but uh thanks, Marianne. It was great. You're I welcome. It. it was Marianne Ebdo with the lure of C SPAN. And uh next up we'll do Karen Marker. Hello. <laughs> hey, Karen, how you doing? Good. I, I also have a um, poet uh, to the prompt, poem to the prompt, um, an embodied poetry scavenger hunt from the uh -huh. word list. I don't remember my, my words, but um, you might notice some of them from um, if you have the same birthday month, which was April oh. for me. And, um, and it's relative what, to what you've been talking about tonight, Tim, in terms of the weather. This is California weather report. Ah, okay. <clears throat> it's a pink pineapple cyclone rain bomb coming from Maui, Kauai, the big island, pouring its lava flows, sticky rivers down our streets, flirty, dirty, it's strip teasing, pole dancing on redwood trees, striking windows, tearing at seams. Yes, it's true we needed rain but not this much decomposing leaf clutter, mud thrown at million dollar homes on our clean cotton sheets. And what about those living in tents? Just follow the arc of this story without a boat, float, flood insurance, safety nets, our world will be drowning with only sticks and stones who will do the rebuilding our life is rising and falling. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. And um, let's see. That was a weather report. I put up the wrong poem. <laughs> Sorry. I was <laughs> listening. So it was a weather report. Do you want to do the other one? Because uh, Sure. Yeah. yeah that, um, oh, sorry. I didn't look at what you had on the screen. <laughs> uh, my other is a response to the news mm -hmm. about um, the cardio cardiac arrest of the football player Damon Hamlin. Oh yeah, that Damon happened during Hamlin. last night's rattle or last week's rattlecast. So I went to I'm a Bills fan actually from you know Western oh, New York. Okay. And so well, I ran know. over to watch the Bills game and wow. it just didn't appear. And it was like it never existed and I was so confused. And then I finally found out that this really sad news that yeah. the right in the first quarter um the, the safety was hitting hard and, and had a heart attack right on the field. So um yeah and they canceled the game. Yeah. Yeah well, you go ahead and read that if you'd like. Okay, great. Healing prayers and destiny on the field. It has a beginning, an end, a middle, like a play with scenes of passion, sacrifice, those we crucify. But what can I say that's not a cliche about this game and our destiny? All I know right now, if I want to be a writer, I must strike out words like love and describe what the heart does. The truth is I've been thinking a lot about football fields and finish lines, running with the ball, receiving the blow, that millisecond between heartbeats that will do you in. I've been thinking a lot about you, Damar, even though I'd never heard your name before you took the hit that for several moments took your life away. Before those steps that fall, I didn't, 
I didn't even watch a little bit of your game. And then I couldn't stop watching you lying there, surrounded by armored men crying and praying, a whole stadium of people in prayer. I couldn't stop thinking about your mother seeing you that day on the field, her boy, a good, kind kid who caused no trouble, discovered at a Pittsburgh Catholic, Catholic school. And what happened to your brain when your heart stopped beating after they'd iced it, slowed it down, all that money rolled in for chari your charity? Was that your destiny? The truth is, you've got me thinking about another boy who became a famous football player, sent to me in kindergarten by his teacher. She couldn't handle all his running across the cl classroom, that leaping, tackling he was doing. So I gave him a sand tray and he went to battle with little army figures, dinosaurs, superheroes, left them and the sand strewn across the room with all those tests and labels it was my job to give him. ADHD, SLD, a child from a broken home, a father imprisoned like so many boys of his day. He didn't fall as you did, but he'd tell me he thought someone wanted to kill him. He had to burst his way out. People thought maybe he'd had a twin who didn't make it, an extra placenta that gave him more strength from the start. Everyone knew he'd play for the NFL someday while I was trying to fix him with play therapy. This was always his destiny. And now you're awake, can talk, can ask who won. You will be the one who changed the game, who rose from the almost dead, while I watched from the sidelines, wondering, can I do better? Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Karen. That was... Uh... Healing prayers and destiny on the field, and uh, sorry that I wasn't showing your other poem. There was I was I wasn't listening at or wasn't watching at first, and there was the panic of like, where is she in the poem? <laughs> I didn't realize you'd sent two, uh, but excellent. Yeah, both both poems excellent all the way around. Thanks for joining us as always. Always a pleasure, Karen. Uh, next up, let's go to let's go to let's go to Polly Alice McCann, who hasn't been. I think I think uh, Polly's been on. Um, oops, where'd she go? There she is. I think you've been on Hello. before, right? Polly, you were on once before, right? Um, I'm an artist. I've I've sent art to Rattle before, but I haven't been to any of these oh, events. That's right. Yeah, you did the cover of um issue like, I don't know, fifty six ish, somewhere like that. So, yeah. Oh well, I'm so glad yeah. you could join us. Yeah, thanks so much. So what do you have to share? Um, I emailed a poem called The Librarians. It's a good poem for a cold night like tonight. Excellent. Yeah. And where are you calling from, first of all? I live um, in Kansas City in uh -huh. Missouri. Very cool. So uh, so I'll put this in a Word doc just so I don't accidentally show your email address. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. This is Librarians whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, let me go. I'm on my phone. Let me see if I can switch over. Can you put it on the screen? Um, I can't. You got to read your own copy somehow. Um, I can. I can circle back to you if you want to. Want to wait? Uh, I think I have a copy right here. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. No, I never no. did this before. <laughs> yeah. No problem at all. Experience. the slowest one here I'll, here's another one because i'll never find the page okay <laughs> okay this one's called macaroni almost as good as the librarians um after the poetry festival everything i say is a poem all my words rocked in another person's rhythm sweet like when we danced on the porch swings our feet swooping up slowly moving forward like a canoe slipped to shore Swinging back in time, back in time, back, when I could see the whites of people's eyes, and the pupil too, the iris, so brown, so blue, so green. 
green like the grass I rolled in as a child, covering me with tiny paper cut, like my lips now, so cut with words. Brown like the earth, Grandpa grew strawberries in, so deep with roots. Blue like gathering ponds on every nearby farm. Refracting, reflecting, light like lips. Bruised blue from a hundred words, knocked sideways by elbows of songs. Remember that song we used to play on the piano? That guy who went to town, stuck a feather in his hat, and called it something. That's how I feel. After three days and three nights of words, words I'll never get tired of, words that mend my broken harp, one string at a time. If I had a name for it, I'd call it something too. If I had a name for it. Oh, that was great. Macaroni, uh, Polly, Alice McCann. Thanks so much for sharing that. And, and so you're a great painter and a uh, poet too. What do you do more of? Um, I I probably do more poetry and I do a lot of editing, making poetry books, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent. What's yeah. The, it's the angel photo that they're painting. Yeah, that, the angel one. Yeah, so people who are subscribers will recognize that if when they when they think Oh, that's about nice it. of you to remember. Yeah, yeah well, that of was course. The, I remember the uh, number, but it's uh maybe it was 60. 62? <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to remember. 66? 66. I know it was a winter yeah. issue, so it must be divisible by four plus two but anyway <laughs> even number yeah yeah but yeah thanks so much i hope you can join us again Polly. Okay. thank you yep take care yeah that was probably alice mccann with uh macaroni let's go to um ann van widgerden hello hey and how's it going there down in um is it malaysia right the philippines the philippines just above just above just Malaysia. Shelf. I have a map in my head, but it, the pin's not very accurate. Okay. Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, so how's it, how, what's it like down there? Is it, is it a stormy or is it a beautiful day? No, it's it's the best time of the year. Oh, it's uh, So December, January, February, it, there's no typhoons. There's no extreme hot heat. Mm-hmm. It's The coldest, though, we get was like this morning was like 21 degrees. That's mm-hmm. uh, centigrade. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. very cold. <laughs> well, yeah. here, here it would be Fahrenheit, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what do you have to share with us tonight? Uh, this is a prompt poem. Um, so at first I was not going to do this. I thought you can't, you're not going to find me dancing or doing any of that stuff. But I thought, why not? I actually have the time. So I hid away in our bathroom. I put on Linkin Park and I went for it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it kind of worked. And then I sat down to write a poem and, and, and also was very surprised how something as you think they're just random words, but it really provided, uh, I don't know. I think you talked about this in the previous interview about it. Prompts can be so releasing. Yeah. And yeah, definitely today can. is actually, mm-hmm. today is actually the, uh, well, for us here in the Philippines, it's the 10th of January. It's the first anniversary of my mom's de- uh, death. And I've, so I wrote this poem yesterday mm-hmm. and that's all I could think about when mm-hmm. I sat down, however liberating the, the dancing was in the bathroom. Uh, all I could think about was my fear of being confronted uh, today. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was a great release to write this short poem. Oh, great. I'm glad you could write it. Here, let's hear it whenever you're ready. So first anniversary of my mother's death. The gnarly texture of time threatens my innards with an ice gun, renewing the resolve of 12 months, clinging to these muddy banks, resisting rivers of tears with every atom of my being, poetry pillowing my soul like a giant flotation device. The cliches of former years sunk like feathers, concrete coated, sacred texts of misread promises. Whether time shoots to rinse or freeze, blessing or bluffing, my grasp is slipping as waters deep they welcome me. Mm, beautiful ending. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and, and very very touching poem and, and you know, condolences are, you know, on the anniversary. Thank it's you. always a tough time for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Anne. Thank you. That was Anne Van Widgerden with uh, the first anniversary of my mother's death. Um, next up, let's go to Dick Westheimer. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dick. How are you doing today? 
Uh, I'm doing I'm doing well. Kind of pressed. There's some poetry deadlines coming up for one of my favorite <laughs> poetry journals. There and... are, and yeah, I probably should mention that that kind of thing too. So we have <laughs> we have the um, the the Rattle Chapbook Prize deadline, of course, which I'm going to send a big reminder email about to everybody who didn't submit. Um, but yeah, that's coming up on uh, and Sunday, January fifteenth. Uh, you know, you got to get fifteen to thirty pages of poems. And um, it's one of the best awards in the in the world, really, for poetry. So don't miss out. And then we also have a um, NFT poetry issue for the summer, which is going to be interesting too. I know you've you know, dip, dipped some toes in the water of NFTs too, so you probably have that coming up as well. Um, yeah, so a bunch of deadlines. Um, and then also, yep. I think the uh, Bengals are going to lose in the playoffs. So there's that as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they lose, I hope they lose to the Bills. Yeah. Oh, thank. Well, same here, because there is there's like a uh, you know a camaraderie between our two teams and cities. Uh, you know, there is that that the Andy Dalton kind of hail mary got the Bills in the playoffs a couple years ago, and um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of similar feel to to Western New York and in Ohio too. So. Um, I, I think so, and and uh, there were there were a lot of feels here here near Cincinnati for. Uh, um, your team but anyway we'd, we'd we'd love to have the opportunity to go ahead and score ahead of you again uh, <laughs> as, as we did. it'll be a, it'll be a good game if we both make that well and there was somebody else on this call from kansas city so this is like oh yeah track. that's true uh, yeah yeah real yeah. problematic <laughs> football conversation um so there's that i haven't had a lot of time to, i didn't get to the uh um um Phone. One thing I wanted to share with people on the spaces thing that mm -hmm. if you're a buddy duddy like me and you do Twitter on your computer, mm -hmm. you can't do spaces effectively. On yeah, your it's true. I had to get the app. You have to. You can listen, yeah. but you can't participate without the app. Right. Which no. I actually I I refused to get the Twitter app for so long because I had such a terrible experience with a Facebook app. I hated the Facebook app, and uh, but Twitter is actually pretty streamlined. It just feels like you're browsing the website, so I, I you know, it's kind of not too bad. But uh, but yeah, you do if you want to participate and not just listen, you have to uh, get the Twitter app. So thanks for that, Dick. Yeah, uh, and it was great, and the interview today was great. Um, so I have I have two poems, but I'll read one, and you'll let me know if I have time for the one that yeah, I sent sure. you. Yeah, sure. I'll read my poets respond poem, and then you give me a thumbs up or down for the uh, one that I just emailed. Yeah, sure. So let me uh, let us know what it was about. Okay. Well, it was Kevin McCarthy poem, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's sort of it. It was just sort of like I was watching the pathos. Not I wasn't watching because I, you know, I don't have C-SPAN or anything like that. But I was, you know, following the sort of pathetic loser-like feel that the whole thing had and so that's that's where the poem came from okay. um, yeah go ahead i got it up whenever you're ready so it's called i am triggered by kevin mccarthy's first 13 humiliating attempts to become speaker of the house we've all been there right you know stalking or obsessing a bit too much or maybe reduced to pleading let me tell you, there was this girl back in the day, and I am so glad there was so no social media then. I did save all her letters, but I'm sure she didn't save mine. Some people try too hard, and all I dreamed about then was standing behind her, my arms wrapped around, us gazing out over a valley or maybe up at the stars, like I'd seen in the movies. And though I could look her up on the internet today and her name is the name of a country at war, I won't. I am no longer 16 and there is enough desperation in the world. Mine still blows in unbidden, like when bits of glitter complicate my poems, like me saying, I love you more than most wanna hear. Like me being the last to leave every party I've gone to, like me, unable to fall asleep while spooning my lover, I am afraid these days that what I've got will vanish, that what I will become is ordinary, that this will be the last time, that this will be the last time, that this will be the last time. Yeah, really interesting poem. And I'm still 
I, you know, I read a whole bunch of poems about this. I still don't really understand. <laughs> and, you know, without, without reading any news articles about it, um, you know, I got such a strange sense of what an odd, <laughs> from, odd... From the poems, I imagine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it was different for different people, mm-hmm. but I was seeing a guy who just so badly wanted this thing mm-hmm. that he was willing to do absolutely anything Interesting. Uh, you know if it would have meant you know like crawling on his back and having him scratch his belly oh, man. a dancing it, bear it was, i guess huh yeah it was it was that sense and interesting you know kind of reminded me of being 16 year old 16 mm-hmm. years old floundering yeah. around mm-hmm. trying to get the attention of the well, girl whose name was the name of a country at war mm-hmm. uh, well the other problem is not too long if you want to do that too uh, sure. That was from last week. And mm-hmm. it was about George Santos, the guy who has this completely fabricated identity who got elected uh, representative from upstate New York. And, yes, and another like, news every- story that I didn't really understand. <laughs> so I guess it's a theme. Today. No, there's no, you know, it's like everything he said about himself was made up. Mm-hmm. No, he said he was Jewish. He's not Jewish. He said his parents escaped the Holocaust. They didn't escape the Holocaust. Wow. They said they were from Europe. They were from Brazil. He said his mother died at 9-11. She died in 2016. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> everything. You know, he said he went to this school. He didn't go to that school. He, and, he, and grand, he, was, you know, though, he was elected, though, right? Like, wasn't he... Like like yeah, he, was he did the whole yeah. the whole campaign and nobody noticed his opponent didn't notice that nothing was real. That that's the thing that I don't yeah. understand. Yeah, that the opposition research I mean, you know, that's a uh-huh. political mm-hmm. mess, like how they didn't catch that. But, yeah, interesting. But he's uh, he's you know, he's a a tragic comic character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, interesting. So these poems are kind of related to let's hear it, identity crisis. Okay, identity crisis after the lies told by George Santos about his race and religion. The coyotes howl tonight as if the world belongs to them. We humans do the same, but instead of howling, we name. Like when a white man says he's black or a Catholic claims he's a Jew. Or what about me Fridays at sunset intoning blessings to a God that does not exist in a language I don't understand? Even the wind whistles its name some nights when I'm in bed, makes me anxious for a storm that may never come. It's like a hope indistinguishable from horror, like a storm breaking a branch. Then there's pruning, which causes a branch to bud, the flower to fruit, and then the fruit to be eaten by you and me, thus marking us well as eaters of fruit. So that's it to be known by our deeds, not our names, to be fruit if we flowered, flower if we've been bud, bud if our branches were snapped by the wind or pruned by the blade of a sharpened shears. We are apple or pear or Jew or human only by way of bees. Yeah, another excellent one, Identity Crisis, Dick Westheimer. Thanks so much for sharing both those. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yep, bye. Uh, two by Dick Westheimer. Let's go to Brian O'Sullivan. Hello. Hey, Brian. How you doing tonight? I'm okay. I actually have a little <clears throat> I'm coming down with a little bit of a cold. So if my voice breaks up, it's not that I'm uh, pretending to be really moved by my own poem or anything. <laughs> yeah, I think it seems like everybody in the world is coming down with something right now. So you're not alone. Um, so what do you have that you'd like to share? So I have a prompt poem that I sent. Uh-huh. Um, it's a uh, started as a prompt poem and all of the words are in the second half of it and i wrote an additional part after writing that that i thought the poem still needed even though i got the words in Mm -hmm. um so it's called irish and american um and first part one to my great uncle mert o'shea 1882 to 1970. tabron oran sorrow is on us for not learning irish Patty and Eileen and all of them, the family says, would run up to Sugarloaf after a goat or a fox to avoid your visits. If you caught and quizzed them, there would have been a uh, there would have been a twinkle buried in your schoolmaster's furrow. You knew scarcity, and much as you loved the language that you were still digging out of the bogs, you knew why your nieces and nephews were making themselves scarce. Eclipses and Titian and whenever, whatever a peg sayers had to say in gay league about seal hunting and the mailman kings of great blasket island were nothing to the young born free or nearly so 
as they dreamed of America, of spiffy uniforms, of making money. And later, in the borough of Queens, a narrowback boy learned that Banya means milk and August means and. August, that was about it. Still later, the narrowback dabbled in Duolingo, learning barely more than enough to say, Ta brown orm, I'm sorry. Silver light falls westward on the sea. August slush is on the city. Mm. Two, and to all the ancestors. You steal yourselves for trouble, August for long journeys over water. August you went, whether fighting August flying like wild geese or empty gutted August weeping in coffin ships, or fire throated August under sentence of transport, August exile, or in ocean liners, August airplanes seeking gem crusted lanes. We in the wide world forget you, August, yet we seek you, falteringly through Christian prayers, August rituals. August through the dark flavors of Guinness, August Jameson's. August through metal, August love shaped into Claudus. August truly through the be loud words of Yeats, August Boland. August at last through streaming RTE, August hearing Irish, ancient, August unyielding, sounding just like this August, August, August. That was a very interesting poem. Uh... The you know hyphen at first, and then what's this? Is there a form for the second half with a repetition, it's or is like that a, just not what you're the doing? The double Debbie sonnet, if there is such a thing. Oh, really interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. That, they're meant to be two Debbie sonnets. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Irish and American. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that, Brian. Thank you. Yep. Take care. That's Brian O'Sullivan with the Irish and American from the prompt, and of course, taking on a life of its own as they often do with prompts. Uh, next up is Angela Gartner. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How are you doing tonight? Doing real good. So uh, what do you have that you'd like to share? Um, I have like two. I mean, they're not that long, but um, the first one is I wish I could be like an AI robot sister. Mm-hmm. And um, this was a Poets for Spawn poem where um, I'm, I'm fascinated with these robots. Like I'm still waiting for the Jetsons where we we're supposed to have all these cool robots helping us, but, <laughs> but then they're scary in some ways. So, mm-hmm. but there was, um, these like three sister robots who, you know, they do different things and, you know, they're trying to make it like they're like friendly faces of the robot. So they're not as scary because robots are portrayed so scary. Mm-hmm. And, um, but you know, like the one, one, you know, one is kind of helpful, but then the other one was like doing poetry and I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> a robot that has all this access that I don't have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. after I wrote the poem, I'm like, well, maybe they're really not that good at poetry. But, you know, I just wish I had that memory bank of of the dictionary and mm-hmm. all this language. And I think my poetry would be so much better. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's one of the ways people are using AI. Uh, Sasha Stiles, who we publish a bunch of times in Rattle, has, uh, and I think we're going to interview her for that NFT poetry issue we're talking about. But she trained an AI to like write poems with her. It's like an alter ego. It's really interesting. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, what was I thinking about? Oh, I was thinking about Camera Obscura the other day. You know, because the, the Renaissance painters that got hyper real were really tracing, you know, upside down images on the wall, apparently. And, you know, and then we had this like big boom of Renaissance art based on that realism they could create by the technology. And so maybe, you know, I, I assume people at the time were saying, yeah, it's not real painting if they're using camera obscura. And they would like hide the fact that they were doing it. So I can really see that happening now. It's going to be interesting to, to watch as AI assists and, and that whole knowledge bank you talk about is tapped in by some people and not by others. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully it won't eliminate us altogether, though, which is the worry. <laughs> but, but yeah, let's hear these poems. We should move on. We should move, uh, roll through them instead of chatting. But yeah, for sure. Let's go. I wish I could be like an AI robot sister. Someone else is better than me at writing poems. The robot sisters who memorize the dictionary, AID and Sophia knows every word rhyme. Don't get me wrong. I would love an AI rosy housekeeper. My oven needs a scrub. The microwave is dirty and cake with scum. Their sister Grace listened to hours of stories like from my grandpa who had dementia. Maybe they could help with the new year's goal of packing and moving a new home. But do the sisters have to learn write, learn to write poetry in their ultra-perfect sentence structures? I hate this struggle to find the right words. Like when you're at the bar to order cocktails, 
but can't name basics in the fancy mixture. So instead, you ask for a boring white wine. The girl standing near in her sleek pink shoes then asks you to hand her a Manhattan. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that, yeah that's going to be <laughs> that's how it feels. I wish I could be like an AI robot sister. Let's do the other one, too. It's not long. We already know what it's about, the C-SPAN. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I wrote this like at like like right before your deadline of like in the morning. I literally like wrote this in like 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I just good. I I just got off C-span, C-span when I wrote that. Uh, so high on C-span. Let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, seriously, I that's what the name I should have wrote. Um, the days and days of C-span. I felt like a hostage to my TV. Days of watching for vote for me, name, nominate, nay, present. It's funny to say these words. YouTube, I want C-SPAN. Wait for the end of a Germans, members fighting on the floor, loud claps, yawns, and jeers. I have to ask, why do I care? When I haven't listened to a vote for a speaker for the last 30 years, there are unread books waiting for the chance to be devoured, an infinity to follow ambulances, watch a tree crack from lightning, hope for a different end to stories. I realized that it doesn't matter, as it was known all along the speaker would hold the gavel. He sang the song he felt was appropriate in his well-rehearsed performance. The CSAM broadcast has stopped. I have to wonder when I will tune in to the theater again. Maybe never. I'm tired of his show, and it's jubilant. Oh, that's great. Yeah, he sung the song he felt was appropriate. That That's kind of the gist of what I was getting from uh, reading all the submissions. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Always <laughs> a pleasure. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Have a great night. Yep, you too. Andrew Thanks. Gartner with uh, The Days and Days of C-SPAN, and I Wish I Could Be Like an AI Robot Sister. Let's go to Nibbity to Karthik next. Hey, Tim. Hey, Nibby. How are you doing tonight? Or this morning, I I'm should say. I'm doing great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm doing great, thank you. Hope you are, too. Yeah, definitely. So what do you have to share? Um, I have a prompt poem. Uh-huh. Uh, so I took the words from my birthday month, which is August. Mm-hmm. So the five words were ready. City, flow, blue, and recycle. And of course, we needed to search for words from the website based on those five words. So those five words were perfect, direction, pattern, lace, and silver linings. So these were my 10 words for the poem. Oh, it's a really small poem. Okay. And it's called Memories. My mind is like a city towering with bright skyscrapers that shadow the dimly lit blue by lanes. Memories lurk in all directions and flow in a crazy coordinated route etched by the tracks and rails of time. But with time, what was once perfect starts to crumble. And like the holes in the lace getting bigger and bigger, this tells me that it's time to recycle the old and find new silver linings. Wow, excellent. I love that. Thanks so much for that. Memories, uh, Nivedita. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Tim. Hope you have a lovely evening. Thanks. I hope so. Bye-bye. Hope. Yeah, take care. <laughs> that was Nibbity to Karthik with our memories. Yeah, it's really fun to watch the way that uh, list poems turn into poems, uh, uh, you know, on their own, how we, how our subconsciouses connect the dots. Uh, we got two poets left on the line. We got Brent Stauffer here. <clears throat> hey, Tim. Hey, Brent. How you doing tonight? Oh, I'm I'm doing great. I uh, I'm gonna have to go back and catch up on everything. I wasn't able to to uh, to to make the actual show, um, but uh, the past few poets that I've heard uh-huh. have been well. I don't know if you'll believe this or not. Really good. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> as, I do. As, as per normal. Yeah, <laughs> as per normal. Um, well, I did a prompt poem uh-huh. this week. Um, I, uh, I, I thought the prompt was, uh, a, a clever way to direct web traffic. That was, uh, yeah. Did you, did you, site. did you like, do a dance? <laughs> I did the you dance. You did the dance. I, I can't I believe I forgot to do the dance. I mean, that is like the most important I, part. And I, I did, I did, they weren't real. I mean, they were movements. Movements. Did, yeah. Dance moves. You know, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like growth was one of my words. Uh-huh. And I went like this. Ooh, Nice. Yeah, uh, and growth, yeah, you're like a tree or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, so I did some interpretative movements. Nice, interpretative sure. dance is a real thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, a thing. Yeah, and uh, anyway, I um, um, was uh, halfway through the poem or more, 
actually I'd come to almost a stopping point and I went, Oh, I forgot about the rest of the directions oh. <laughs> about like, about like using the body movement stuff in the poem to be more in your body or physical or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I kept writing. Uh-huh. And, Excellent. And, yeah. Push um, it farther. That's perfect. I, I think it's, yeah. And I think it's all right. Yeah. I mean, it's not great, but it's all right. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear it, Brett. <laughs> Okay. Painted desert long ago. Constellations scattered across a southwestern sky. The Milky Way like a zipper. What's behind it? The old Buick is playing dead. So let's lie down here for a while. She's been running for so long. Let her stay in park for now. This is the show we came for anyway. The desert air grows cold and clear as a bell. Feel the warmth gently rush through the rusty hood and muzzle our stretched bodies. Lean your head against a smooth, unbroken windshield. Behind the galaxy strung above us, endless years eager to spill. I tried so hard not to write a love poem. I just did. A uh, really cool turn at the end. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Brent. Behind the galaxy strung above us, endless years eager to spill. That's great, great. I love those lines. Yeah, thanks, too. Yeah, take care, Brent. Always, <laughs> I appreciate a, always it. a pleasure, yeah. Hopefully I'll see you next week. Yep, yep, hope so. Take care. Okay. That's Brent Stauffer with a Painted Desert Long Ago. Now we have Lucy Chow here from China. Yeah, can you hear me, too? I can. How are you doing tonight, Lucy, or I guess this afternoon for you? Right, it's near noon here. Yeah. It's a pretty beautiful sunny day. Excellent. And and what do you have that you'd like to share? Um, I've got two prompt poems. My birthday is in November and now it's in January. So I did both of them. Oh, great. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so they're both pretty short. Yeah, feel free to read both of them. I'll put them into a document really quick. Oops. Um, there we go. I want to make it... Not very long, so I guess I'll do both. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, please do. Um, the first uh, poem I did for it in uh, January and February is called Heaven and Ocean in Motion. Waves surge and surge, rinsing their living richness up from the deep homes of fishful corals, renewing the ocean's humming energy. Even when eyes seals blue with white, beautiful, diverse, unique, irreplaceable life goes on below weaving their kaleidoscopic coralline textures. Above the azure draperies endlessly rinsing themselves magically new and clean, the wind is a clear humming feather that bows on the sky's seamlessly woven strings, singing the blue loon into frame after irreplaceable frame of renewable sky writing. Oh, beautiful poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. And again, that was Heaven and Ocean in Motion. And then you have another That's, one too. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a collection of three haiku, but actually it's a little kind of scene that the dance motions got me into. Interesting, so. yeah. Um, imagining myself dancing in this kind of um, urban paradise. It's a little queer, but um, it's interesting. Yeah, it sounds like it. In, uh, um, in the second haiku, that this is this weird word called, um, I believe it's pronounced uh, Vladuid. It's hmm. a, a Welsh goddess of flowers. So interesting pronunciation yeah that's i never heard of that interesting yeah wild honey words whispered in the park one my mosa zippers shut at the softest smoothest zephyr's flirty flip Mm -hmm. two forage grows in box blinking to the bee's goggles her bloody weaved blues three Pruning to cactus flowers hovers the gently floating hummingbird. 
Excellent. Yeah, those are great haiku. Thanks so much for sharing those. A wild honey words whispered in the park. Thanks so much, Lucy. Always a pleasure hearing from you. Yeah. Bye, Tim. Bye. Have a good night or good afternoon, I should say. All right. And that was, uh, yeah, Lucy Chow with two poems. And I'm going to shut off the Zoom because that's the that's it for that. <clears throat> Let's see. We have a little bit of time. Maybe I could stretch. Um Let's see, we have some short poems from the prompt. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, so Andrea Dobrika has one attached as my attempt to tackle Emily's prompt poem from last week. I still can't shake the feeling that the prompt actually tackled me and won, she says. The ten words are in italics for those watching along. So I'll read this for Andrea. Uh, this is the poem that fought me. The poem that fought me, I know it is there by the way it curves, soften, the, but, sorry, let me start over. I know it is there by the way its curves, soften the edges of my faith, your inner sanctum double-walled in the heritage of failed lovers. It took most of my sanity, lost in this holy city of worship and dual natures to gasp. I shall not be granted passage. I was ready, silver bullet nested on my tongue, its pale blue metal taste unfurling like morning mist. You were still reluctant to place your step in this world. Its soul threatened, threatened to drag dirt past your threshold. Confusion and dread flow in with floodwaters. You will not allow it. This time I swallow the mercury metaphors. Recycle my pride this once you win. Andrea Dobrika, excellent poem. Thanks for sharing that. It was hard for me not to say the um, italics in the wrong way. Sorry, I kept tripping over that part of it. But it was really cool to see where the words came from and recognize some, uh, someone else has a similar birthday in common with you. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting prompt from Emily. Um, let's see. Do um, you have any better with a short one? Um, so Steve Horrell is here from um, Merville, B.C. in Vancouver Island. Um, he says he has to leave after the featured poet, but uh, if you, you know, you'd like me to read it. Um, the ten words were rinse, skin, renew, love, ice, blue, texture, zipper, feather, bag, uh, and they're underlined here. So I'll try not to read them unusually, although it is really fun to see. Uh, the dance part was low key, he says. So this is uh, the full hippie shot. And let me, uh, let me give this a shot. The full hippie shot. Don't worry, love. Years ago had a local for the cartilage. But now I'm going under. Lisa, my nurse, told me, you get any grief, just ask for the full hippie shot. It's really good. I have complete confidence in Dr. Van Sittert. He'll remove ends of thigh and calf bones, renew my knee with new metallic parts, zipper me up at the end. I'm sure it was the sound of the bone saw. Then the hammering woke me. A low blue curtain at waist level obstructs my view, probably prevents blood, bone splatter. Also easier to rinse everything off. The anesthetic asks, what are you doing awake? I'm thinking he's the wrong person to be asking me. The noise, the saw sounds, the hammering, and why am I awake? You tell me. The anesthesiast, uh, with, a, with an ice grin, gray skin, textured bags under her eyes, asks, would you like some earplugs? My eyes feather in and out of focus. Last thing I remember saying, no, just give me the full hippie shot. <laughs> That's pretty funny and terrifying at the same time. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that, Steve. Um, I would definitely, I will take the full hippie shot myself if I'm ever having a, a reconstructive knee surgery. Excellent advice in addition to a fun and uh, terrifying poem. That was Steve Harrell with the full hippie shot. Um, I think we're going to have to call it an end there because it's getting late um, there's a couple more people, but, um, I'm not gonna be able to get to you guys this time, but if you have, uh, if you want to share it next week, feel free and, um, I'll keep them up here in my inbox really quickly. Um, we are going to do the, uh, Saiku and the Saiku is right here. This is an article as it always is, um, an article from inverse. And so here we go. Let's see if we can get this so you can see it. Um, there we go. Um, Aztecs used the sun to help build their ancient empire, new study reveals. And so what they did, they, studying this, they used a sort of a model to track where the sun would be at different points of the horizon and showed that there was sort of a, 
a, a reason for this this temple being built in a certain place because the position of the sun against the other monuments that they were lined up with on the other side of the big huge valley um was um all lined up perfectly to to tell them what the scenes were so they know when to plant and things like that and um so a really interesting study of course that ancients were fascinated by astronomy and uh, this is in the valley of mexico uh, where mexico city is and um Really interesting research from the University of California, Riverside, right down the street from me. And uh, the Saiku for this week, based on that, inspired by that, is right here. Not that one. Is right here. Um, winter sun crawling up the walls of the cabin. Winter sun crawling up the walls of the cabin. That is the uh, Saiku for the week, and that is the show for this week. Um, Next week's guest on the Rattlecast, and I was thinking about playing uh, one of her poems, but maybe, man, well, we have time. Maybe I'll do that. So next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Sonny Greenfield. And uh, we published Sonny just once in a print issue, but she is like the queen of Poets Respond. It's to the point where it was her poem that inspired uh, Poets Respond. Uh, let me pull this up. Um, it was Sago, North Dakota, or, or not Sago, North Dakota, Sago... Uh, Let's see. Let me pull this up really quick. Sega, West Virginia, I should say. And this was a response that Sony wrote way back. It was in issue 36. It was published in 20, 2011 um, about the Sago mine disaster. Um, um, and she says about it here. Let me show this on screen, too. We'll do this poem. Right it's not a long poem, so we'll do this really quick. She says, sometimes there are some tragedies that I can't shake, and I try to work them out with words. Maybe it's my own therapy. Maybe if I apply language which is sensible to that which seems senseless, I can make peace with the human condition. I'm not sure it's working. Martin Toller, one of the miners, left a note that read, Tell all I see them on the other side. It wasn't bad. I just went to sleep. I hope every word of his note is true. And, um, and yeah, so the miners were trapped down there. Um, several of them, I can't remember how several of them died. It was a, it was a mine collapse in, in West Virginia. Um, and then there was the whole news, um, you know, trying to, you know, rescuers trying to, trying to get through and get them out while they still could. And, um, and Sonny wrote this poem in response to that disaster. And I remember getting it, and she mentioned, I think, in her cover letter that she wrote it pretty shortly after. And I was thinking, like, gosh, this is going to be published a year from now. And um, wouldn't it be nice if we could publish it right away? And that was the first thought that, that led to Poets Respond a couple years later, or maybe one year later. Um, and here it is. This is Sonny Greenfield. Really quickly, next week's guest on the Rattlecast, reading uh, Sago, West Virginia. Sago, West Virginia. The blast was a rumble, rock cascade, stone seal. The cave was a pinpoint of unlight a whole, whole, the wives cried. The coal, a black ribbon pinned to a lapel. The gas was methane in a shaker, a drunken slew. The lung, an inky sack that wrapped a greater body in a bag. The letters said goodbye. The miners pulled a curtain, prayed a sinner's prayer. The lamp, a nightlight as each crawled into sleep. The survivor, made a baker's dozen, the 12 no longer there. And that was uh, Sega West Virginia by Sonny Greenfield from Rattle Number 36. And she's going to be next week's guest on the Rattlecast. Uh, that is, uh, she has a whole, she has two books actually that just recently came out. Um, All Possible Histories is one of them. She's also the author of Letdown. So it's her third book. She's got three books of poetry. Two just came out in the last two months. So, um, oh, and the prompt for next week. I am sorry. I should have done the prompt first. The, uh, the prompt for this week coming up is going to be uh, right here. Um, and this is provided again by today's guest, um, Angela Voris Hills. So here is another one. Next week's prompt is um, think about a time in your life when you felt like you lost yourself. What were the circumstances? Use as much detail as possible. How did you find yourself? Again, write for 10 minutes. That's step one. Step two, type into your search bar, if you don't, and then just one more letter. For example, if you don't R. How does the search engine think you might want to finish the sentence? And so here's her list. So it shows, um, if you don't 
R, if you don't receive your W-2 buy, if you don't rock and stone, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. So that's the thing. So there's going to be a list of suggestions um, on Google or whatever search engine you're looking at. And um, so use those. Choose one of these as the first line of your poem. How can you tie the ideas together? Maybe you could incorporate a few of them into your poem. And that is the prompt for this week. And she says for inspiration, um, do this, uh, read this poem by Maggie Smith. A poem beginning with, oh, this is short too. I'll read this too. Poem beginning with a, with a t- retweet. And this is by Maggie Smith from back in 2019. Uh, this is on her uh, website at, uh, at blueflowerarts.com. So let me, uh, I'll read this to you too. This is um, Poem Beginning with a Retweet by Maggie Smith. If you drive past horses and don't say horses, you're a psychopath. If you see an airplane but don't point it out, a rainbow, a cardinal, a butterfly. If you don't whisper, shout, albino squirrel, deer, red fox. If you hear a woodpecker and don't shush everyone around you into silence. If you find an unbroken sand dollar in a tide pool. If you see a dorsal fin breaking the water. If you see the moon and don't say, oh my God, look at that moon. If you smell smoke and don't search for fire, if you feel yourself receding, receding, and don't tell anyone until you're gone. That is, a, that is a Maggie Smith poem, poem beginning with a tweet, a retweet. So that is your sample for, uh, for next week, and then so do that. So think about the time you were lost. Type in that into a search engine, um, if you don't, and then a letter and see what it comes up with, and then write a poem trying to tie those two things together, which should be a really interesting prompt. A lot of um, a lot of leeway, but also a lot of guidance in that prompt, which is always fun. And once again, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be Sonny Greenfield um, with her two most recent books. Uh, one of them is All Possible Histories. That is Monday, January 16th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.